So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, whenever you listen to this. This is Match Media, alongside with Critical Band in Crime, Ricardo Medina. Hello, hello, hello. And this is another episode of BS Beats and Beauty. Boy, oh boy, we have a lot of shit to talk about, boy. We got lots of shit, lots of shit. <sighs> so, what are we going to talk about, boy? Well, before we get to our usual pre ramble, uh, we, have to, we, have to do our, we have to do our album review, boy. Yeah. Yeah, album review. For the third studio album from Pusha T, formerly yes. <laughs> of the Clips, uh, called Daytona. Now, in the hip hop world right now, everybody has been going ape shit over this album. People have just been talking and tweeting about this thing. So, we are going to share our thoughts on the album. So, we're going to do a track by track review of it, which is great because in this case, we only have seven tracks to talk about. So, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, well, would say a bonus track, but I'll talk about that when we get there. Because of that, we seem to have a working feud involving Drake. So, yeah, we'll find out if if Mail Doc is relevant to this discussion. Uh-huh. Uh, I'll be kind of uh, dismissive of, of his response to the pusher because we find it a little too quick. Uh, so he's like, wait, how? You know, how does he he would uh, respond that quick? Yeah, I, I was actually wondering that myself. Now, like, how he did? I'll be so suspect. I'll be suspect that he just is make distracts in general and have it waited <laughs> wow sure? we just have some verses this written down it's like alright piece of you piece of you piece of you distract you know what I mean right um, apart from those that we also have some TV shows we have to talk about uh, for one thing I'll be talking about yeah. the final season of um, Stars Ash vs. Evil Dead because I promised you all a couple weeks ago or three weeks ago whatever that I was going to talk about it so um, since this kind of not as relevant as it was back then i'll just do like a quick review of it um also right. uh we'll also we will both of us will talk about um season four of the flash which uh wrapped yeah. up last week at the time of this recording um you saw well you f- f- uh watch out the complete season one of krypton so you can talk about that yeah uh also it right also in terms of movies we have to talk about um a movie has been getting a lot of buzz, boy. A lot of buzz, boy. Some people say this is one of the best of the year. Revenge, boy. Yeah. And last but not least, um, a movie that, um, as we said last week, uh, came out, um, well, last Sunday, I should say, on HBO. Um, much hyped, in my opinion. Um, it has Michael B. Jordan and Michael Shannon in it. And it's yeah. a remake of a popular dystopian Mo- um, drama from 1966 and it's based yeah, on a famous, famous very famous book yeah. from uh, Ray yeah. Bradbury I've never read it maybe you could fill me in and if the book works on right. that Fahrenheit 451 right right so before we get to all that stuff though um, a little bit of news a little breaking news a little general news stuff right, right um, well we just mentioned the, the very unfortunate passing of um, John Bean most also known as Total Biscuit um, right. I think it was just worth mentioning. Uh, yeah, he was really, really popular in the in the game and world. Um, you know, he had a, I think he won a StarCraft team. He had two, two, I think a couple of very, very um, big channels on YouTube. He had a big following online. Um, and, uh, he, and he did a lot for consumer protection stuff um, involving. So, uh, yeah, you, you, get, you get a bit political for it. But um, unfortunately, about three or four years ago, he got uh, diagnosed with cancer. Oh, um, wow. I think cancer of his um, his bowels, I think his bowel, lower bowel cancer, whatever it is. And yeah, he just he basically through a very long battle, he is unfortunately um, succumbed to it. So I wow. uh, just want to just mention that uh, he's a really really big name, and he's a, a pretty stand up guy from what I understand. Hmm. Um, I wasn't the biggest follower of him, but I used to follow some of his videos because he was he was really early on. Um, he used to get games pretty early on to talk about it. Now. So I used to just listen to him. I, was, I admit I'm not the biggest, biggest fan, but I used to follow him. Um, there's a couple of times. There's a couple of videos I used to pick up on. Um, so that's about it. Uh, just to mention, you know, the person of John Bean. Um, also known as Total Biscuit. A big loss, and he was pretty young as well. He was our age, 33. Oh, really? Uh, so it's re- wow. Yeah, yeah. So it was really unfortunate. But that yeah. played itself out, I think. So yeah, so that's about that. Um, other news. What's the other news I want to mention? 
Oh, right. Well, so very sad news, but we will go to very good news. Um, what probably my favorite TV show online right now. Um, well, sorry, my TV, favorite TV show on TV now it's online. Um, the the my, one of my favorite shows, a show I've been hyping for a while, The Expanse, right. uh, was canceled by Sci Fi about a week ago. What? And people was re- yeah, people was really worried. It's not really sad. But remember, a bunch of shows got canceled um, a while back. And Brooklyn Nine Nine got canceled. A bunch of other shows got canceled. But, well, canceled and like, then uncanceled, I think. Um, well, not uncanceled, just picked up by another network. Um, Brooklyn Nine Nine got picked up by NBC, which is great. Um, oh, well, okay. it's not not that not that surprising given Andy Sandberg's history. Right. And then uh, the Expanse finally got ca- got picked up by Amazon, uh, which is oh, excellent sweet. news. Is the best possible place it could go, in my opinion. Amazon, pong for pong, Amazon has better shows quality wise than Netflix. Uh, Netflix have good shows, but Amazon has great shows um, on average. Um, and yeah, the Expanse, and I really hope, one thing with the Expanse that I used to knock is that it, the, the budget and the, the production value wasn't as high as it could have been. Right. I um, remember you mentioned that um, before. Right. So, so I hope with the, with, uh, with the move to Amazon, I hope they get a little more money. And yeah, congrats to the, the people at the Expanse. And I, from what I understand, it's picked up for multiple seasons because it's a, it's a long running book series. It's, mm. I don't know, up to that. I think it's like close to 10 books at this point. Um, and the show is pacing itself, and it's it's rough. Where the show is is like about book three right now, um, so it's pacing itself, um, so, you know. And yeah, the, the season three is wrapping itself up very soon. So great, uh, big big fan of the, this this show. Every, almost I like everyone in that show, and they have a bunch of great little character actors coming in and coming out, and little people from sci fi that you know. And it's it's a great show, and I really really it's like one of the best news for a while. It has All that right. worth mentioning. Well, well, I hope that more people check it out now that it's on um, on Amazon. Really yeah, I, I was really worried. I was really worried I was going to go the fate of Firefly for a while there. Um, you know, they have a great sci-fi sci-fi series that just get cut short in its prime. Yeah. Uh, I'll see that. Yeah, so that's about it. Okay. All right. Yeah. So let's jump in now. Let's let's do let's focus on some music first, some hip hop music, right? Yeah. So now we're gonna talk about um the Daytona album or EP or whatever it is you want to call it. I, I call it an EP because Shit runs for like 24 minutes, but people are going to say it's a studio album. And, um, well, the, why... the, 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 definition, the working definition is that um, if you want to be nominated for a Grammy, um, it has to be, I think, f- at least 15 minutes long in five sections. Right. That's the working, that's the working criteria for being for getting, a, getting, a, getting nominated for a Grammy. That's it. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I, I just want to look at it from from number of tracks. So when I see seven tracks like this album here, I I instantly think EP, you know. Um, okay, no problem. But yeah, technically it is a, a studio. It is a studio album, right? For better for worse, right? Um, it's part of you know Kanye West's um, well, good music project, basically. Well, good yeah. music being his record label, of course. So you know, um, it's this project basically where they're just playing out albums, these short albums. Um, Throughout the summer, basically, so the Tona right. is the first of these releases. Um, so eventually, later on, we'll hear stuff from like, um, um, you know, Tiana Nas. Taylor and Nas, yes, Nas, and yeah. of course, Kanye West himself, right? So, right. um, this album came out uh Friday at the time, well, last Friday, the time of this recording. I right. was aware of it coming out, but I was telling myself, well, maybe this is one I could just sit on for a while, nobody's gonna talk about it. But then as soon as it came nope. out, people just started talking about this one particular song, which we'll talk about, and Pusha taking shots at um a Drake and all that kind of stuff, Dread. So I was like, oh, 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 we get there. All right. So yeah. <laughs> Curious B went in, taking this album, um, heard no singles for it. Uh, I don't think we're going to get any singles, any radio songs from this um, from this album anyway. Not yet. But I don't know. Yeah. Right, so um, I'll just do like a quick kind of track by track review. Uh, Ricardo, you could just get a button and you know share your thoughts on particular tracks, right? So, right, first track is If You Know You Know. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I like, uh, yeah, I love the, the, the kind of murky, kind of menacing beat. Um, I love the kind of hypno- hypnotic vocals in the background, this kind of like yelp, like yelp that goes on in the like in the chorus mm-hmm. in particular. Um, but there's a beat alone, which is produced by Kanye, because yes, Kanye does a majority of production on this album. Well, essentially, he does the the production for the entire album here. 
But um, just that beat alone, it, I mean, if it pushes um, brags and boasts about his experience in drug dealing game, and if you know Pusha T, you know he's a guy that ever since he came out, well, I don't want to say he came out in 2002 with clips with his brother uh, Malice, now known as No Malice, um, but they were in the game prior to that long time, but it's just in 2002, that's when it got big with the album Lord Willing, and of course that song Grinding, that was just inescapable. Yeah, true classic. True classic, right? One of the best beats Pharrell Williams, and the Neptune, sorry, ever produced. But anyway, so um, I love the intro, like how he uses the word boy and how he has a a, a, a few other sounding, similar sounding words. Now. So it's like, waving at rude boy, I'm waving at you boy, ran off on the plug yeah. too, like true goy. I was like, ah, ha, de la soul reference. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, still, ducking shit that I did, boy. Niggas in Paris for Hit Boy. Hit Boy yeah. being one of the producers of, you know, that great song, Niggas in Paris, which of course is that yeah. song with Jay-Z and, um, and Kanye West. Ball too hard, you know, love that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Also love when he says, you don't take these types of risk, boy, because this boy been throwing that D like rich boy. Right. Get it? Rich boy, throw some Ds. Which is like yeah, the yeah. oldie great song that man ever put. What whatever happened to Rich Boy? Anybody knows? Please comment below. Whatever no. happened to Rich Boy? He just had that one great song, and then I don't know. But anyway, um, no, the uh, only thing he known, the only thing he known for is that meme where he biting his bottom lip at his boy. <laughs> oh right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I love the refrain in the song. This well, if you know, you know, you know, <laughs> and it kind of fits this whole well, if you live this life, then you know where I'm coming from. Kind of vibe of the song. Um, it's a great way to, uh, to to start off this project, I I must say, and yes, to 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 take well to quote you, yeah, it had it real hard. So yeah, yeah. Th- th- thoughts on on track number one, what do you think? Yeah, 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 yeah. Nothing to mention. It, it started the album strong. I say e, uh, album EP started strong. Uh, this is a hard song to bump. Uh, yeah, I didn't think about it. I didn't put on no analysis. I just listen to tracks and I just enjoy what I enjoy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, strong well, I know you, but I, I I just had a sit down and take in what's going on there. so um, track number two is the games we play um, I love yeah. the guitar riff on this beat it like like what um, Anthony Fantano of um, the Neil Drop shot out to him it's called like Air Worm it's just like something that when it goes into your ear you just can't get out it, that riff just just sticks way. just sticks out in that, um, in that beat um, I also love the, the kind of bluesy kind of horns in it I love the hard hitting drums here and once again, well, this is just Pusha T basically talking about this coked up celebration of like just living that glamorous luxury life there. Um, also, love how he pays tribute to like the rappers that influence him. You know, whether it's NWA for gangster rap or mafioso rap like Rayquan and Jay-Z. I love these particular lines where he says, to all, my, to, to all of my young niggas, I'm your ghost and your ray. This is my purple tape. Save, it, save up for rainy days. This okay. is a reference, of course, to Rick One's iconic um, debut album, Only Built for Cuban Links. Um, you know, Ghost being Ghost Face Killer, Ray being Rick One, Rainy Days being a track off that album, and Purple Tape, which was like, you know, because they were hustlers, they, they, their, their, marketing scheme, their marketing gimmick was they would sell this album. Like, you can remember back in the days, you used to have these things on cassettes, right? You know, Kids Actually Parents, yeah. right? So to stand out from the crowd, because they kind of had this. They add this kind of drug dealing mentality to it, which is like, well, if I want, if I have this particular product, like think Blue Magic, for example, right, from American Gangster. Yeah. I can't be selling it like how everybody else says. So this is my product here. You're going to get it on purple tapes, hence purple tape, right? Um, he's, he even makes a reference to Jeezy's Politics as Usual song from um, Reasonable Doubt, which was, ain't no stopping the champagne from popping, the drugs from dropping, the law from watching. It's like, oh, okay, we're doing the reference thing here. I love that, right? Um, once again, it, it plays with the whole, if you lived it, then you know where I'm coming from, um, especially with the hook says, these are the games we play. We are the names they say. This is the drug money your ex nigga claim he makes. <laughs> I love that, boy. I, I, I was kind of wondering if he was a, if he was um, calling up, like making out a particular rapper or two, but I think it's just for certain rappers. I, I, can't, I can't really call any by name right now. Or stuff to talk about, yeah, yeah, I, I could sell weight and move weight and all that kind of stuff. But you know, yeah. they don't, they, they haven't really, either they haven't really done it at all, or they haven't made as much money as I assume Pusher did back in his um, drug dealing days. But yeah, solid track or dope track overall. What are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, 
pretty badass. Loved it. Uh, didn't really. There's a track I kind of don't think about too much, but yeah, pretty great um, overall track in this one. Nothing to talk about because not my favorite track on the album. Okay, fair enough. Well, ne- neither for me. Um, track number three, Hard Piano, featuring Rick Ross. <laughs> and the, right, joke is like, that, yeah. the joke is like, they just couldn't come up with a proper name for this track. So it's like, here's what we have a piano in this. Yeah, let me just call it Hard Piano, right? So ever, right? <laughs> you know? Um, and yes, it's a piano driven beat. It's moody, it's jazzy. For some reason, it kind of reminds me of um, one of, well, my lips, if you if you remember, if you know him. Uh, one of the interludes he had on his uh, Quasimoto album, The Unseen. Just that, bim, 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 din, 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 something like that. Something about that beat right. sounds familiar, right? And why I say that too is because uh, Kanye going back to his sampling roots boy with us, right? Yeah. So, you know, which is which is good. We we, we, we want back, like we, we've all wanted that old Yeah, we want the old Kanye, you know? right? We want the old Kanye, right? <laughs> um, but anyway, so Pusha gets assistance from um, fellow drug coke rapper um, Rick Ross and basically both of them just talking about their transition from the drug game to the rap game um, I felt that both MC sound great even even Rick Ross though I find I find yeah the man just getting so more and more months, like, you know? compelling dread on the mic bay. like I don't know like no, you somebody that always you somebody that always has, had, his, had his moments and his tracks you know I, I still really like stuff like um, the original me back music his oh, track yeah, on yeah, his yeah, yeah, boots yeah. on that yeah um you know, um, which is uh, the one with Freemason. I still like his, his worst on that. Oh, yeah, great, uh, great song, by the way. Yeah, 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 we move on to not like a, the worst rapper, but no, it's no, just, no, you know, no. it's, it's, it's just something just... that he plays on cliches sometimes, you know. Right, and, and he probably like, want to bring little... up his history, you know. Exactly. That was it's good, but, yeah, but... A little bit of a fake in that sense. Right, right but, but after nothing. that, no, it's just like, all right, Lemma actually proved that I could rap and that's where I felt like yeah, he, he actually started to get better like more compelling I should say right um the chorus from the world famous okay whatever, why is he why is why is Tony Williams the world famous I don't know whatever um oh. it, it's, it's catchy but it's one of those hooks that are, are ki- that kind of had a grow on me especially with that Santa Domingo kind of thing it's, it's, it was like I was like um uh, uh, okay, but like I say, it's, if I if I lose this track more and more, I would I would actually kind of you know get used to it. But the first time I was just like, um, all right, okay, <laughs> whatever. But yeah, other than that, song was solid, really really dug this, right? Um, next track, which is one of my favorites, "Come Back Baby." Um, I love the seventies yeah. kind of soul inspired beat. Um, it has this kind of black exploitation kind of vibe to it. I really love it. The bass line on this. Which shows up every time um, Pusha raps. Holy shit. That is some trunk rattling shit right there. Wow. Um, but basically on this track, Pusha is all, he's on this, he, he, he essentially is in love with the Coco uh, mode right now. So he's just talking about, you know, how, how dealing drugs basically got him a lot of money, right? So he loves selling it. He loves making money off of it. Um, he has a shit ton of memorable lines here like, Dope, this is how it starts, oh by the way. Dope just touched down, I'm so grateful. Number so low, bitch be thankful. They say don't let money change you. That's how we know money ain't you. Bitch, I've been had, bitch has been bad. We buy big boats, bitch, I'm sin bad. Ooh. Uh, Downright yeah, sinful, uh, bitch, we been full. All my dope boys, we like kinfolk. And then <laughs> the chorus, which is just literally this um this a sample basically from this George Jackson song. It's like just this like icing on the cake here. It sounds brilliant. I love the transition from the chorus to the actual verse. Brilliant. It just switches by so so smoothly, Jet. Smoothly. So yeah, I, 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 I love this track. Come back, baby. I love this song. Um what about you? You you love it or not so much? Yeah, great track. Uh yeah, great track. Uh, it, again, this is another one of those that just you know it flow so well, yeah. That's taking it in uh, I, again, I didn't do any major analysis on, on it, but you know, it just yeah, hard, hard. <laughs> yeah. And you know, as as our colleague, our colleague in, in retrospect, who is Doughboy, would say something like, "Tell it's like a fact <laughs> that uh, yeah, say so it's like a kind of fact of of thing being on that level." Mm-hmm. Um, we call it, you know, it's a fact of him being in the top ten MCs of all time. The, the Pushana. Yeah. So. Yeah. We were talking yeah. about that top five 
sorry, top five, top ten thing in in a bit, right? Um, right. Next track we have is Santorina. Um, this is for me, well, in my opinion, one of the one of the darkest tracks on this album. Some may argue it is the darkest, but I will leave that for last track, right? So um, the beat has this kind of contemporary, kind of trap flavored beat. Um, one of my favorite music re- YouTubers, uh, my name is Sean C, was saying it has this kind of Dr. Dre explosive kind of beat that ding, 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 kind of way you know, going so. Um, and it has some like moody guitars in the back there. Um, but then, like, everything's going okay, but then it just switches into this like dark kind of dramatic beat though. After the haunting Spanish language refrain from this uh, chick named 070 Sheik. Apparently, she's a signee to good music now. Uh, she, uh, well, from what I've what I've um, seen like on YouTube, she was in the in the music biz for like a, a you know for for a while now. You know, um, at first, uh, well, I have to confess, I thought it was really a dude that was singing this part, but it is her actually. But with this track okay. here, um, he's talking about his feelings over the murder. Of his friend and road manager um, Devon Pickett, um, the the title Santorina refers to the way of the saints, right? Which is a Cuban religion yep. that uses mediums and um, divination, divination, sorry, to speak to yeah. spirits and deities, right? So in the beat change now, um, Pusha is just literally talking to Devon's spirit. He's like literally vowing revenge on the guys who took his life. So it can either interpret it as either a lyrical or physical revenge. But just like, yes, I am going to fight these people and they're going to pay for this shit, literally. Like, if you're reading between the lines, it comes off like that. Um, but yeah, so for me, it is it is one of, if not the darkest track on the album. But it's not one that I would go back to. But it's still, it's still, it's still a solid track overall, but it's not one of my favorites. Um, what are your thoughts on Santorina? Yeah, yeah, that, I noticed, I was just listening to some of that. Like, yeah, it is it is the darkest track on the album. Just to talk about straight up revenge you're not sure and again in the case of Pusha T you're not sure if that revenge is physical because he is he has a history right yeah. and you're not sure what's going on there and uh, yeah it, I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that it is probably the dark track in the album I, I enjoyed it I, again it's one of those tracks I don't return to all that often um, because I still, I still now started to listen to the album right. um, just like a couple of days back but it's only really the, the last couple of tracks the track that I kind of listen to the most so you're getting to that now yeah yeah right so second to last track what would Meek do? Featuring Boys. boy, <laughs> Easy. Kanye. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, right. Now, I am one of the few that would say that this particular beat on this track is the weakest on the project. Um, okay. But it's no... It, not saying is the worst thing. Right? It's just compared to everything else, it's kind of the weakest. But um, with a few more listens, I know it will grow on me. For one thing... I don't know. For me, it just has this kind of like E.T. slasher music kind of beat going on. And then when the drums hit, it's like, oh, okay, now I'm feeling it. Yeah. Now I'm feeling it like real grimy. I could like real fight to this now. Right? Um, Basically, it's just Pusha and Kanye just talking shit to the haters and the doubters now. With um, both of them saying, niggas talking shit, how do you respond? Um, right. Pusha talking about his much deserved place as one of the top five MCs in the game. Well, that's yeah. his opinion. That's his opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, amongst other topics, like, you know, his drug dealing come up and the authenticity of his lyrics. Uh, Kanye, yeah. of course, talking about the MAGA haps. I love how he covered with the scoopity scoop bars, which right. sound less funny and annoying on this track for better or for worse. And, of course, right. the media calling him, call him out and seeing that he's insane and he's out of touch with the black community and all that stuff. Um, right. His final lines, though, seven pill nights, you know, how, you know what that feel like. No more hiding his scars. I show him like seal, right? Yeah. That, that was a uh, moment, boy. That was a moment. I was yeah. like, oh. oh then, th- okay. Listen, this okay, oh. so this this is this is my favorite track on the album. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's the track I enjoy the most because it's like, you know, in, in the context of going dog and it's like again, it was because of all the bullshit I went down with, with him and the, the politics. Um it just make it funnier. Though. Right. And it's like, you know, and the tracks, to me, it's, it's my favorite beat is the beat that pulled me in the most. All right. Like, well, oh, this hard though. Yeah. Good. Yeah. But, but, but more, for, for me more is like the, the, the lyrics sound out more but the beat will grow on me you know it, it will grow on me it will grow on me um, and now we get to the final track by the the, 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 the controversial track that had the whole internet by right. storm by Infrared yeah. um, 
this beat though um i love how cold and how sparse it feels now. um and then you hear in this infrared vocal sample just echoing through the the, the beat though you know it, it's almost like like um pusher is just like at the top of this mountain and nobody's around and you just like yeah. talking talking out loud basically and you're just hearing this infrared thing this vocal just echoing dread you know <laughs> it just has this kind of weird cool feel to it now but dude this man just goes all in he's just exposing yeah. the, hip- the hypocrisy of the rap game now um from MCs and again they just do for one thing Will Smith's Grammy win back in the 80s and then afterwards how they didn't really you know how they just kind of felt he went pop you know but you know, never right. acknowledge the fact that yeah he, he was the first rapper to win a, um, a Grammy and then by the way he wasn't even allowed to attend the or, the, the, the ceremony he wasn't yeah. even allowed to do that right because I think they had some issue with, with you know rappers and they, you know just them being in something like the Grammys and all that kind of stuff so it was really sad now you know um, to <laughs> to the pop appeal of Jeezy's Hard Knock Life because they say well you know how how he sampled Annie and all of a sudden he has this big hit and he's the talk of the town but the man was putting in work for years he was making great hits before Hard Knock Life even came out right um, right but the biggest um, criticism we have here of course is you know MCs well Drake. today's MCs either not living the life they right present or having people fabricate the right, image yeah. for them which is either managers record execs or ghost writers right um yeah. this to me is pushed at his, his deepest his fiercest his darkest right hell of a way to end the, the album off even though Kanye yeah. just had to end it off with that kind of weird musical book end you know it's, it's so Kanye you also have to end things off on a kind of weird note <laughs> but anyway right. so the bars though, the, 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 the bars that had people going crazy starts off like this game's fucked up niggas beats his bargain nigga your hooks did it the lyric pennant equal the trump's winning the bigger question is yeah. how the russians did it it was written like nas but it came from quentin Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and people was like what yeah quentin as in quentin miller you know um the, yeah. the, 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 the ghost writer of of, of, of Drake now, right yeah, and yeah people just went crazy for that boy um yeah real crazy for that um but this man had so much great lines here boy like um niggas get exposed I see the cracks and I'm the liar should have been exposed I took the crack and built the wire uh, <laughs> <Hard. laughs> yeah. um yeah let's cram numbers easily the only rapper so more dope than me was Easy E. How could right. you ever write these wrongs when you don't even write your songs? But let us yeah. all play along. We all know what niggas for real been waiting on. Push. Drops the mic. <laughs> Walks away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was crazy. But um, yeah. brief history into why this, this kind of turned out, right? So... Apparently, this was Pusher kind of taking shots back at Drake because um, Drake put out a song a couple of years ago called um, Two Birds, One Stone, um, where he kind of mentioned, you know, um, the credibility of Pusher Tina. Like, you, you know, you, you play like use Escobar or whatever it is. You know, you know, no Escobar. Now. Um, so Pusher's like, oh, okay, you, you, you come at me like that. So, okay, I gotta make you out for you having somebody ghost write your lyrics. Now. Um, also, yeah. interesting too is how he talks about. Um, about Baby, or about Birdman, and um, and, and Lil Wayne, because uh, there was right. a song that he he put out. I think it's called Exodus Twenty Three Eleven. I could be wrong if I got that title wrong. Uh, where he took shots at um at Lil Wayne, specifically, right. right? So well, here where he says he says basically is, oh now it's okay to kill Baby, Baby as in Birdman. Niggas looked at me crazy like I really killed a baby. Um, salute Ross as a Rick Ross because he message was pure. He see what I see when you see Wayne on tour. What I assume that means is basically how um, the, the pressure that Birdman put in on on Lil Wayne, how he's not he doesn't want to put out his um his his content. So the well, sorry his album basically right. Um, I think it's yeah. Carter Six. So now I'm assuming the 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 only legit way for Wayne to to stay relevant and make money is to do tours, you know. So it's kind of like, yeah. well, I can't even just make money off of my music anymore. I just had to keep touring until I get old. I can't even retire, you know? So, so it's kind of like Pusha just kind of feeling a little sorry for him, basically, you know, right? Um, yeah. But yeah, boy, there's just so much great lines in this. This is easily 
my opinion, the best song on this this um this album. Right. Hand this down, is this is not my favorite. Yeah, album. it's my second favorite track. It's very very close. Uh, right. Again, the, the Drake stuff is what what was I was focusing on because it's like <sighs> Drake popular and look the ghostwriting thing you can make you could argue back and forth about it, but sorry, once you're ghostwriting, you're kind of out um, of the discussion of of how seriously somebody should take you. Know? Like yeah. you could you could play this you could play this um what aboutism and 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 back and forth about. Um, well, everybody's goes right, or people who you think is this big pro, this really goes right too. But I just once you get exposed for way, for that, you kind of out the discussion in many ways, yeah. and we go find out how 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 people play this going forward. So, um, are you going to make mention of of Drake's response to this? Yes, this would be the bonus right. track on this album. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, the bonus track is Drake's Duppy Freestyle. Right. <laughs> what, was, what, was, what was funny is how how sudden this, this track came out now like album release was Friday and then Duppy Free Cell just literally came out on the same day like what? what? already? Okay. right how? now yeah. personally I would say for a Drake this track because I mean this is not the first time he took shots at other rappers I mean there was Pusha T before um, there was Peak Mill and <laughs> that you know infamous beef that he had where you know which we mentioned in season 1 of the show here um, but yeah. you know for, for this track this was actually pretty decent though but what I would say yeah. with, with him though with Drake like he's not the loud kind of vicious guy he's not the the Tupac hit him up he's not that type of person but what he does make up for it though how he's make up for that lack of you know viciousness is just being critical of his opponent just being so razor sharp about it too like he will just watch you and pick out every flaw and make you out now that's what he does he did with meek now he doing it again with push the t right so um the producers of this beat are um jahan sweet and boy wonder um the beat is kind of interesting okay have this kind of bluesy kind of downbeat kind of like norish kind of mafia ish kind of instrumental now like you can imagine this is what some kind of mafia boss would just sit down on the table and just be rapping on rapping in front of you like that now you know but it it really fits neatly with his he sounds disappointed though he sounds like well dude we 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 talking about this forger like come on you know See, he sounds disappointing. He sounds angry about it, you know. Um, I love how yeah. he starts off these songs. Like he just kind of get right off the bat one time, which is, so if you rebuke me for working with someone else on a couple of V's, what do you really think of the nigga that's making your beats? As in Kanye, yeah. right? Taking shots at Kanye. I've done things for him. I thought that he would never would need it. Father had to stretch his hands out and get it from me. That's a reference to Father Stretch My Hands from the um, Life for Pablo album. Um, I pop yeah. style for 30 hours, then let him repeat. 30 hours being another song from um Life for Pablo. Pop style was one of um was one of um Drake's songs. Now you popping up with the jokes. I'm dead, I'm asleep. <laughs> um but he had some great standout lines here. Well, I'll just read out a few. Um I like how he questions the whole top five thing, which he mentioned what would Meek do, and, and then of course the authenticity of his um, you know, his drug dealer persona. So he says your brother said it was your cousin than him than you so you don't rap what you did you just rap what you knew don't be ashamed there's plenty of niggas that do what you do there's no malice haha <laughs> get it malice no malice right there's no malice yeah, yeah. in your heart you're approachable dude man you might have sold to college kids for Nike Mercedes but you act like you sold drugs for Escobar in the 80s I had a microphone in yours but then the signature faded I think that pretty much resembles what's been happening lately ouch yeah. Also love what he says, don't push me when I'm in album mode. That that's like the like that's like the tagline of this song. Don't push me when I'm in album mode. Because yes, Drake is working well almost done. He's putting the finishing touches on his Scorpion album. And I, I still don't know why people not making him out and saying, you know, Eve had an album called Scorpion in her. It had one of her greatest right. songs, Let Me Blow Your Mind in her. So why you call on your album? <laughs> why you call on your album, um, Scorpio, Scorpio, whatever, whatever, right? So, don't push me when I'm in album mode. You're not even top five as far as your label talent goes. Ouch. You send shots, well, I got to challenge those. But I bring Calico to the Alamo. And also like how Drake kind of end things off. Not on a bitter note, but a more ironic one, which is, it's going to be a cruel summer for you. I told Wheezy and Baby, I'm a him for you. Tell ye, we got an invoice coming to you. Considering that we just sold another twenty for you, 
And if y'all guys go on Twitter, if y'all switch it right now, man send that invoice straight. He sent it to them. <laughs> right. Which is like the perfect like slap to the face, but in a way it's more like him seeing that, you know what, people will buy, listen and stream to Daytona just because of infrared and because of the track that Drake put out anyway. So it's like right. I kinda help him all your sell all your album anyway. But um right. my album coming out just now, you know. But you know, you already know, you already know. Despite what we would say about views and more life and all that kind of stuff, you know this 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 Scorpion album can do way more than the. Oh yeah, it's just this, this, Drake is just a popular because of yeah. Drake alone. So that's right. the irony of it, right? But yeah, um, I I I actually dig this 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 track though. It's not one that I'm gonna be listening to over and over and analyzing it. It just came, it happened. People are gonna talk about it until something else pops up, but. I'd, I'd applaud Drake, but I have to applaud him for, for putting this out now instead of doing like a Nicki Minaj and waiting, well, putting out a single and then trying to sneak this somebody in it. You know, it's right. just like, hey, I ain't album mode, Jedi, trying to stay focused here and putting out quote unquote quality product. So let me just see what I have to say about you and let me move on. So I don't know if that means that he's going to take more shots at him on the Scorpion album. I It could happen, it's Drake. He, he, yeah. he is known for sneak dissing people a lot, right? Um, right. Especially exes and whatnot. But um, I don't know if this, if these two songs, Infrared and um, Doppy Freestyle, are going to escalate to this full beef. I want to say full beef. I'm not talking about one crew versus the next. I'm talking about one song versus another one and another one and another one back and forth. I, I doubt it. Right. But, you know, yeah, this is what it is. But um, just to get back to the tuna. Um, I thought that the album itself as a whole was solid business. It's short, it's concise, to the point. Uh, doesn't overseas welcome. Um, I imagine diehard fans who might be might argue about why it's so short. I mean, seven tracks, twenty four minutes. But yeah, dude, just all for the quality of it alone, the solid flows, memorable bars, pretty decent production throughout from Kanye, Kali. Um, yeah, these fans are gonna be listening to this shit again and again and again. And while yeah, I won't call uh, like myself the biggest, me, um, I won't call myself the biggest Pusha T fan. I mean, I I love some of his songs. I still think Numbers of the Board is the best song that man ever produced. That is like the bash your your your, your skull onto a wall until it bleeds type of music. That is just insane. I love Numbers on the Board, right? But yeah, but yeah, as far as I concern, sorry, as far as I'm concerned, I I dug this album, dude. This is easy yeah. one of my favorites of the year. Hands down, I'm gonna be listening to this again, and just because it's short, I mean, but that's what was mad, dude. That's what was mad, dude. Albums, I mean, to me, albums don't need to be more than ten tracks. Yeah, well, well, for me, tracks I, most. I, I, I'm more tick of it in terms of length. So, for me, my yeah. my limit is like a sixty or sixty-five minutes. If you go beyond that, you yeah. have to have you have to have a reason. You have to have a reason why yeah. you're going to because, 70, because 70, people bullshit with the length of the albums. Drake, 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 now guilty of that. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. Um, Amigos, yeah, guilty Amigos of that. did it quite recently. Uh, Reshrimmon did it, but their excuse is that it's cut like to three albums. Some you have such a long album, though. Yeah, but it's they, across like a kind of gaming more than thing. Is like, oh, you, it's like is YouTube is YouTube of albums, though. Right. You just give the system not really quality wise. Just oh, you just pull out a long length and you just have a handful of good tracks. And yeah. that's not bullshit. Now, no, but it's, it's for streaming purposes. That's why. That's why they exactly capitalize on that. But personally, I I don't like it. Like I don't need to hear. 24 tracks of Amigos. I don't want to hear three yeah. albums of Ray Truman. I really don't. I really don't, right? Yeah. But anyway, but the, the, the short tightness of it works. Um, I'm not even going to argue about if it should have been longer or whatnot. These seven tracks are just so potent enough that... Yeah, well, um, yeah I, uh, I, I it, it, on, on The Breakfast Club, Pusha T had a big debate. He said, he said there was a huge argument over the length of the album, um, you know, in the studio and whatnot. Oh, so okay. I, I, I thought it. that they kind of came... Well, all right. Of course, they came to agreement. But I thought that they both went in do, um, wanting to do this whole seven-track thing in the first place. I didn't know nah, I don't think so. I think it was track. supposed to be... There's a big debate about whether or not it's going to be longer or not. And that's the whole thing. So, I don't know. Right. Oh, and speaking of debate, how can we forget, by the album cover? <laughs> oh, right. Uh, with yes. the Houston. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, so Pusha had, had his cover done. Yeah, It was approved and everything like that. And then by Kanye also. Yeah, bye bye Kanye. And then Wednesday late night by one AM the manga call from Kanye is like, bro, we had to change this to the 
I got to buy this yeah. with, the, with the Houston photo for like $80,000. <laughs> and that got to be album right. cover trend. And I get, I get. Yeah. It's it's the um this bathroom. Well, the bathroom that you would that you. It's her bathroom, in. yeah. It's her bathroom, right? Right. But this, yeah. It wasn't taken. It was taken before she died, of course, right? But it's how dirty and how cluttered it looked. You could tell that she was yeah. doing drugs. Oh, fucked up. Yeah. yeah. So I get. It's supposed to spark, not so much controversy, but more interest. Like, oh, this is so provocative. Wow. I wonder, yeah. if, well, I wonder if that's what that that what I had to say about Daytona. Wow, you know what I mean? Right. And then right. of course Daytona is a reference to um the Daytona watches, which is yeah. What, well, well, according to Pusher, his favorite brand. So it's more like talking about just the the you know just a luxury life now, but in comparison to drugs and the effect of drugs now. But it doesn't really matter to him because in on the album he's a dope dealer, so whatever he's just making money, right? Um, but yeah, as far as it goes, um, I I give this a decent four to five, man. This is. Definitely one of my favorite um, albums. That the, well, one of the best albums I've heard this year. I really enjoyed it, especially for it, yeah. well, and for its short length. Yeah, I don't know what we're gonna get with these other albums from um, um, from from good music, especially with the short lengthing. But I hope that we get quality over quantity with yeah. this one, because it could still give us seven tracks of garbage. Like I'm hoping that we do get that with Kanye, but it's kind of possible. But Right. We'll see, but I don't know. Do yeah, I totally dug the tone. The tone, the tone was was the real deal. It was a real deal. So last last thoughts on um on the tone. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a bumpable bumpable album for me. Again, the last two tracks is the big highlight for me. Uh, I I'd put it on my phone to jog with yet, but it it did. It just it real hard. I could see myself really enjoying this in the year, not coming here so. And yeah. I just take a while to get onto albums anyway, so. So yeah. now big big steam, you know, it'll take forever to get into open mic eagle on you because of you. So You're welcome, you're welcome. Stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, so it's all about that. Mm-hmm. All right, cool. So moving along from music now, now we're going to get to some TV, right? So, yeah. uh, all right. So I will start things off with um, Ash vs. Evil Dead, the final season. Yeah. Um, it's from Stars. Now, yeah, just a brief little history with, with, with the Evil Dead franchise itself, right? I am a bonafide fan of Evil Dead, right? Um, the first, well, I mean, well, we, we I'll, I'll have to mention the trilogy itself. Uh, the first one, Evil Dead, with the Evil Dead, sorry, which came out in 1981. Um, of course, everybody will know it as the, the landmark debut feature of Sam Raimi. And I would say it's easily one of his best movies. Um just blew me away the first time I saw it. And it was around that time, this this phase of my life where I was gravitated into to cult films, right? To, to midnight movies. And I was hearing so much about, about Evil Dead, Evil Dead, Evil Dead. And I watched it for the first time. And I was like, okay, this 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 is something, Joe. This is the real deal here. Um, I love the, the kind of visceral, bare bones approach to things. I love how they just went above and beyond the call of just, just scaring the shit out of the audience. Um, even though when you look at it now, it doesn't, it's not as scary as I might think of it, but just the viscera in it do really um, stand out. Um, but in that show, we were introduced to the character of Ash Williams, played by the man, the legend himself, Bruce Campbell. Yeah. And while he wasn't the mean, mean, mean character in it, basically it's just a bunch of dumb teens going to a cabin, but somebody was there before and opened up this book called the Nepro- Necronomicon. Or which is titled the book of the dead somebody read from the passages and recorded it so when you play that tape you know um once you call once you speak this um, particular chant which always ends with kanda 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 it raises up the spirits right Sp- um spirits of the dead and these spirits basically torment you they torture you or they possess you they possess you and you will go and kind of lash out you'll go and kill everybody around you and it's just about just pain and torture and just all that good demonic stuff right um but what i like is just how what the man should do with the low budget of it from one thing that track and shut you know just that high speed cap um track and shut that just feels like it just sneaking through you know trees and whatnot and then smashes through windows or bursts through doors and just keeps going and then you're just hearing this loud kind of sound effect and it just sounds incredible um, the what they did in terms of prosthetics, you know, in terms of just blood and um, gore and stuff, because it is a ridiculously gory and bloody movie. Um, what made the film quite infamous, unfortunately, 
was what is taught what is dubbed now the tree rape scene which is where one of the characters literally got raped by this tree that was possessed um and even some yeah. this day was just like i kind of regret making that scene and you know for me look at it now it's kind of poor taste but you know yeah. if you if i look at it as just part of the overall scare factor of the movie then it works but still it's something that they could have taken out right but i yeah. still i i really enjoy um the first evil dead movie but it's when the second one when when I got to the to Evil Dead Two, Dead by Dawn, that was when I was like, okay, Sam Raimi is the truth, Bruce Campbell is the truth, Evil Dead Two is the truth, and it still remains one of my all time favorite movies. It is one of my favorite horrors of all time, one of my favorite horror comedies of all time. Um, because really, what they do here, they just amp up the thrill level to about eleven. It's just full tilt, no breaks, just edge of your seat trills and you know just <laughs> crazy insanity and a lot of humor is, 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 uh, in this as well too this is what really made it still uh, stand off for the first one the first one was just straight up horror this one added some slapstick humor did and this case here with evil dead 2 you got to see bruce campbell really shine as a as a physical actor you know what i mean you could argue and say well he's not really so much a great actor don't mind his chisel look and all that you know makes him stand out but really, is his uh, physical approach to, to humor what stands out? You know, man is like you know, is like thinking about like a Charlie Chaplin or Harold Lloyd. You know, just for eighties schlocky horror movies. You know, um, the moments with him in the the cabin himself facing all of these demons is just amazing. You know, just what he puts himself through, and you know, um, and it you know, is is a testament to how faithful he was to um, well, you know, as as friends. Sorry, to Sam Raimi. You know. Uh, cause both right. of our friends and they they more or less were um were trying to raise the funds to make the first movie to begin with even enlisting the help of the Cohen brothers to help out as well but you know it's just bruce was just so committed to the, to the performance though so committed to the movie and you know he just puts himself out there you know he does embarrasses himself he does a lot of things himself physically but it's all for this you know for for comedic effect and yeah also First, I kind of feel like, wow, we as the viewer, as the viewer, sorry, uh, we 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 could we could we are feeling we are we we feel like we're going in scene just like this guy here, you know what I mean? Um, but I really really love this movie here. Um, but it is easily the best of the trilogy, hands down. But interestingly, how that how that movie ends is where you know, in trying to destroy the book, he ends up going back in time. He goes back to the 12th century, or was he? I think it's the 13th century, 12th century. I can't remember. I think it's the 13th century, right? Um, where he meets um these knights, and then we get into 1992's um Army of Darkness. And this came out right after Sam Raimi did Darkman, which I still think is right. one of the most underrated superhero movies out there. Um, but Army of Darkness, while it's my least favorite of the of the trilogy, I I still do enjoy it. But the reason why I don't like it as much as the, the first two is because instead of going for horror, he goes more for like a fantasy adventure vibe now. And I mean I get it because you're in these medieval times, but it just kind of comes off more like a Saturday matinee than uh, a Sunday night horror flick, you know, which the first two movies were. I mean, it's enjoyable, it's fun, but to me it's just a little too fun. It's a little too lighthearted compared to like how, you know brutal the first movie was and how in over the top insane the second one was but it was still a decent way to end the the, the series off um yeah one thing though well the fans will know this there were there were actually two endings made for the movie uh one ending basically well this is what you see in the theatrical version where ash returns home where well it starts off with him basically working at this um, department store and then he ends up going to the um to the cabin and all that jazz and then when he comes back home he goes back to the to the cab uh, so he goes he goes back to the department store and then this demon possessed witch shows up and then he pulls out the shotgun because if you know uh, one of his um one of his signature weapons is a shotgun and also he has the the um the chainsaw because his chainsaw hand was removed arm. because it yeah. was it was um possessed so he had to cut it off possessed, and then, yeah. yeah so he put that chainsaw arm it's awesome and you know it just ends up like that where he just kisses one of the girls is like long live the king baby great way to end it off right really you know kind of fan friendly way to end things off but the alternate ending that they had and they end up changing it last minute because um well in test screeners people didn't like it which was where 
And this is because Ash is kind of an idiot when he's ready now. So the wizard in amongst the Knights of Sumeria told him to chant this particular chant and then you'll go back to the original time. But because he forgot what it was, he said the wrong way, he ends up waking up years into the future. It's like, oh shit, I woke up at the wrong time. No! <laughs> it just kind of ends there though. It's kind of funny when you think about it, but I do understand why it is they, they cut that out. So uh, before I get into the Ash vs. Evil Dead series, um, what are your thoughts on, on the Evil Dead trilogy? Have you seen the movies? Is, uh, is this a yeah, I watch it. I, watch it. I, is, I generally like Raimi, but I never get into these movies anywhere near as much as other people did. Um, Darkman, love Darkman. I don't know, it's just out of, out of all the Raimi stuff, even though it's his big signature franchise, I never really got into this, um, frankly. I just watch it first. I watch them once. I really like them. Like, I kind of get why they're popular, but I never get into it. It's one of those, though. Okay, understand. Um, I don't yeah, know. I, 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 I would call myself one of the the, the, the the cult fans of this show. It's just something right. about it. The, the bare bones approach it is what I really love, though. And um, I don't know, just the the intent to just entertain the audience without not giving us too much story, but just more style over substance. But it's one of those rare examples where it works, right? So yeah, Bruce Campbell, you know, he was still trying to keep his cult status, you know, um, intact. He appeared in Hercules' Legendary Journey. Journey, sorry. He yes, in he was in that, right? Princess, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's Zeno, yeah. Both of those shows, which were uh, produced by this guy called Robert Tappert, who was involved yeah. in the Evil Dead series. But that's, um, that's, well, that's Sam Raimi. I know um, yeah, and then, Sam Raimi. His brother was, was there too, yeah. It was a, re- a recurring character on yeah, um, both shows. Joxa um, the Joxa Mike. The Mike. Yeah, Joxa the Mike. Yeah, remember right. that. Um, yeah. He was in Burn Notice, which was a show that I just never got into. Yes, uh, that, that was a show I, was, I, I actually really liked. Yeah, and then, and then I didn't want to see it. It's just I never got around to it. That's all. Um, he okay. sang a couple of movies like Baba Hotep, which is another cult favorite, which is him playing um, an old Elvis. It's like everybody thought Elvis was dead, but he's actually in his retirement home. Long story, what you right. will understand. And it's him basically facing off, him and Ossie Davis um, facing off against uh, Mummy. It sounds weird, but when you see it, 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 it works. Um, but it's really his performance as Elvis that really stands on. The story, not so much. But yeah, cut to some years later, and we got the word that um, we were going to get a, a, a Evil Dead series, right? right. And it was going to be on stars. So right there, I was thinking, oh, they're going to do the they're gonna do the Spartacus thing. Where right. <laughs> they're going to get away with a lot of blood, a lot of guts, a lot of, you know, just schlocky sleaziness, now, you know? Which is what made um, which is what made these these Spartaca series so memorable and watchable. Like I I would I would I would confess I was a fan of it. It was one of my it was one of them guilty pleasure kind of shows. Like I know it ripping off three hundred. I know I know I know. It's like this real R rated heavy R rated version of of three hundred. But there was something about it that was just so schlocky about it that that just really that I just really liked. You know I don't know about you. I don't know yeah. if you are a fan of the Spartaca series. I, just I never get into it. Yeah, but you, you should I, check I never it out. got into it. Yeah, you should check it out. But yeah. keep your expectations low. It's it's not one of um, you know, type of shows, right? It, you don't have to think about the show, right? So right. yes, so we get to Ash vs. Evil Dead. Um and just for the, for the off the first two seasons alone, I really enjoyed it. Um for one thing, what I praise the movie for is like this is in a way what the third Evil Dead movie should have been. Um, the time when it came out, which was like a couple of years ago, you know, it was just the right time because here you can get away with so much. For one thing, it has more cursing than the than the old movies. But the old movies never really had any cussing to begin with. Um, the violence is way more bloody. It's way more over the top. It's way more gratuitous here. But in a TV Emmy kind of fashion, you don't go too too far. But there are moments where it's like, right. wow, y'all y'all just kind of tone this down a little bit it's way too bloody but then again that's always been a treat of the evil dead series how much blood you could just pack into one movie right um but essentially where the story here is with ash williams of course of course he's old um he has moved on from the events of evil dead he's working in a new department store one of his um colleagues is a guy by the name of pablo who's played by ray santiago um he's he's like this he's like the the the, the hispanic sidekick to ash right so one night while he's hooking up with some young chick with some with some chick basically he has the necron no he has the necronomicon on him basically so he's drunk and he's high and he just so happens to read the same chant that they have worn in the first two movies never to read 
He reads it out right. and then unleashes evil. That's what they call it, evil. Um, in the process, they meet um, a girl by the name of Kelly. Um, one of my favorite characters, actually, as well. I, I don't know. I just like how she looks at... She just has this real ballsy, you don't give a fuck attitude about, uh, about herself, too. And, yeah, Pablo kind of has feelings for her, right? So, we just kind of follow them through their adventures, trying to defeat evil. And in the process, um, we meet none other than Lucy Lawless herself. Yes. Right. She shows yeah. up, right? Um, she plays Ruby... She is revealed later on in the, I believe it's in the second season, that she was the one who wrote the book in the first place. She's the one who, okay. yeah, which, if you know, um, was the pages were from human flesh and the, the words itself, the, the, you know, all the kind of demonic uh, figures and whatnot were inked in human blood. So she was the one who came up with the, with the, who wrote the book in the first place, right? And she was like this harbinger for the end of the world. So she was like giving birth to all these like evil little demon babies and all. It just went insane, right? But what really right. made the series so fun was just Ash himself, the relationship between him and Pablo and Kelly. And just his character himself being this real old but real kind of jaded, still like an asshole kind of character. It's just like whatever. And him trying to live up to the glory days of being a hero. It's just like, yes, I will do it. But everybody else kind of like in season two, for example... Um, because of what happened in the first film where unfortunately he had to kill his sister uh, everyone started calling him Ashy Slashy right so he's like the the, the legendary bad guy he's like the Freddy Krueger basically of this area and, you know you're not supposed to go next to him because he'll use that chainsaw and kill you right um, but where season 2 ends is where um, he actually went back in time to the 80s to that exact time to um, before before the book went well when the the um, when this uh, archaeologist guy found the book in the first place. So he went back right. to that actual time to stop all this stuff from happening, end things off once and for all, and then he went back to the to the present. It's like, yes, everything is good. So now we get into season three. And Ash is assuming everything is all good. Uh, he, he he starts his old department store, but it also, <laughs> in this like, little subtle joke, it also has sex toys on Celia too. So you could get your lumber and all that, but if you go in the back, you could get dildos and all that kind of shit, right? Um, right yeah. Pablo is still helping him out, but he has his taco stand outside. Kelly has moved on because she just wants to find her own, you know, her own path. Because from the first season, her parents got killed uh, from from demonic possession itself. So she's trying to move on as well, right? So, um, yes, yeah, somebody gets a hold of the necro um, Necronomicon again. Somebody reads that passage again, sees that chant again, evil is unleashed, so now the team has to reunite now and stop this thing. But um, what's interesting here with this season here is because is that they touch on family. So in season two, um, Ash's father got killed, unfortunately. Um, so Ash learns in season three that he actually has a wife and a daughter. Well, wife in the sense that they got married in some sleazy little... You know, like, them kind of Las Vegas kind of marriages, now, right? So he knocked up, right. had a kid, and then he just bounced, now, you know, because he's that type of character, right? Um, but then she and her daughter returned, because the daughter was in this, well, in her college, and, well, they got attacked by demons. Her friend got killed in the process. So, you know, um, they, they're trying to get him to, to find out what's going on in the process. His wife gets killed, so now he has to take care of the daughter, and then there's just this relationship between the two of them. She doesn't really like him because she find well, kind of blames him for the death of her mother, but then she eventually opens up and they become friends, right? Well, you know, not friends, but you know, they they, they grow to like each other. But really, um, what well, the main villain here once again is uh, Ruby. She returns, and in this case, she is playing this um this. Well, one of um one of Ash's daughter's teachers, basically. So she's hiding out in just in public now, so nobody knows that she's this evil sorceress and whatnot. And just about them basically trying to to get the book, and um, <clears throat> and just basically trying to stop the apocalypse from happening. And you do see signs of it kind of um occurring. And I don't want to spoil anything beyond that. So quick review about Ash versus Evil Dead. So, um. Before the final episode actually came out, I think it's about a week or so before the final episode was aired, the announcement came out that Stars was canceling the show after three seasons. So I was like, "Oh right. gosh, man, you're 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 serious, Jay? The show's going so good, and you're just wrap the show up." So I was curious to see how they're gonna end things off. And I would say, if you are a diehard fan of the show, if you're familiar with with Army of Darkness, especially with those endings that I mentioned, 
you pretty much yeah. would kind of sus- um, could, could expect how it's going to end, especially with um, Yadaktus and Evil Dead 2, because they do a clever little play on the endings of those um, those movies. But um, right. I've always been a fan of, of this series here, and this season here did not disappoint at all. I really enjoyed it. Um, I wouldn't go as far as saying it's one of the best season. It is the best season in the in the um, in this in this um, in this series as far. But I would okay, I, I don't know. I, I just have a soft spot for season two. Season two just kind of amped things up way way more. Now. But this one, you know, because it was touching on family, it it got the it it's you know it was a little bit more heart woman. You really felt for these characters way more. It's not just about them just being in these really ridiculous bloody set pieces but you do connect with these characters more given the situation that they're in um i really connected more with with uh, with ash you know he does really come true as a father figure to this to this guild i really love that about the show and it makes sense given um seeing what happened last season with his dad and whatnot right um the progression of the other two characters as well um kelly and pablo i thought with pablo for one thing what well, i forgot to mention um, he got possessed by the book itself, so there was a there was like this subplot in season two where he himself was challenging himself. Well, the book itself was challenging through um, through Pablo's body, and you know him. Well, the actor himself had to really put himself through a bunch of like, just excruciating scenes you know, of him just being tortured and ripped apart and all that stuff. And this is just because of his character, because um, because right. So because his his uncle was a shaman. He has this history, like it, it's, a, it's in his bloodline, basically, of you know this power in his family, this supernatural power in him. So it was he was put to like the ultimate test in season two, where physically he was just being tortured by the Necronomicon. When here he he comes off a lot more confident in himself because yeah he has to go through this this um this supernatural kind of um this supernatural kind of transformation into a shaman himself you know so he's more in in tune with you know just the weird stuff that's going on around him i thought that was great um kelly herself yeah. opens up more to to pablo really shows that she does care for him because at at first it's more like yeah he's just a friend he's just a friend you know one of my buddies but in this one right. she really shows a like in him like a strong like in him i thought that was great here um but one thing that the show really excels here is just these gruesome over the top set pieces and if you're a fan of evil dead you know what i'm talking about where is like any little yeah. thing it could be like a fan or something just possessed and just what could ha- what what would happen if this corpse comes up from the dead or if this tree is possessed or if this fan is possessed it's just whatever is there in the set piece what will happen if it gets possessed and what crazy insane stuff we could do with it and they do that here as well um there's one scene in a spoon bank that's all I'll say. Bruh. It's insane. <laughs> how they how they played that off was just incredible, boy. Um, and this really stays true to the Evil Dead formula. And this is one thing that I always loved about the show. It always stayed true to that formula. It's always about these over the top scenarios involving demon possession, and always about this character trying to trying to avoid it or succumb to it or trying not to succumb to it, basically. Um, Lucy Lawless, I thought that she was great as well. She has her ulterior motives as well. Um, and after the events of the last season, she's not to be trusted. But, you know, she has a part to play in this, you know, entity world kind of thing. And I also love the fact that it does have this sense of fina- um, finality. It's more like, you know, all this stuff that we've been fighting for over the past three seasons. And in Ash's case, over the past 30 years, has to come to an end. And the way how they come to an end, like I know it may disappoint some people, but all I say is it does open up the possibility for well, I guess not a, a new season again. I don't know, maybe it might get picked up from Amazon, maybe I don't know, or Netflix, God forbid, but if they do another movie, uh, or you know, but I just if they decide to do anything going forward, I just hope they do it before um Bruce Campbell knock on wood kicks the bucket. The man isn't getting any younger here. Um and Right. Still, he is Ash Williams. He owns that role. You do buy into him being that. You know, you do like him, even when he crack a little steel joke. When even when he does something, you know, out of time, and, he, and especially when he gets himself into one supernatural shenanigan after the next. You know, you do like him. Um, 
but yeah not much more i could say about this season three i thought that it ends it ended off the series on a fine note and as somebody who owns the evil dead movie trilogy i see myself actually buying the box set when it comes out man for ash vs evil dead so for me this gets a, a decent four four to five stars if you are a diehard fan of evil dead then you will love this you'd actually love the whole series as a whole like i, I don't know you i'll be hard pressed to find any evil dead fan who probably hate this series or think that it's not as good as the original series i would say it's actually better than the original movies as far as i'm concerned in terms of just yeah the technical aspects of it um oh yes i forgot to mention technically this movie um this series is excellent as far as tv shows go um production value cinematography the directing the you know they do use a lot of canted angles and also just the the gore effects you know they have a, they use a lot of prosthetics in it you know it, it almost rivals walking dead in terms of how much it do in terms of just getting that gory visceral horror effect into the show but yeah um whether you're a fan of it or not or if you're just curious to see to see what this evil dead thing is about then i strongly recommend that you watch the old movies first before you jump into the series but if you haven't seen them in quite a while we revisit them you know um they're still great popcorn movies um and then jump into the series and i guarantee that you will have a blast with it even right down to the to the, to the end of the series finale which like i says opens the possibility for you know more material but i just hope that if they do decide to do that yeah please please do it before 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 bruce get too old and he in a wheelchair and he can't he can't he can't do anything by himself properly please do but yeah apart from all that i enjoyed it so definitely check out the final season of ash vs evil dead all right so now we're gonna right. move on to some dc stuff so uh while i give my throat a little break here you can talk about season one of krypton how did that go uh this was pretty awesome Pretty awesome. The next okay. record to be this good. Yeah, okay, the next record to be this good. I it, thought that they would have fall apart though, because like um, no, he has yes. okay. a good score. So right, yeah. so yeah, okay. Um, it's one of those. It's a it's a slightly frustrating thing to watch because it's if if the movies did a better job of addressing or did, did their shit better, um, I wouldn't mind this so much. And because this takes itself way too seriously and kind of shenanigans itself, um, it's hard for me to buy into it uh, because I don't, I don't really care to take this seriously anymore. Right. You understand what I mean? Like, they don't, the, the movies don't fuck things up so badly, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like, well, all right, let me see. But I decided to jump in, see what it's about. And yeah, I, I actually enjoyed it for what it was. Okay. Um, it's, what it, the purpose of it is that it's based on Superman. Uh, it's his grandfather. We focus on Superman's grandfather, and the story starts with uh, well, Superman's grandfather is Segel, uh-huh. and then his grandfather um, is ousted from the events of um, he's ousted from Kanto because they live on Kanto, right? right? This is a city on Krypton, right? So when everybody hear Kandor, they immediately thought, oh shit, that have to be a certain character that they know who's related to Kandor coming up. And that's what we get. And basically, well, it's implied that the reason why they don't know about Kandor, uh, the reason why all of this shenanigans happen is because of the, they, they discovered that aliens exist for the first time. And that was like a big blasphemous statement. Right. Right. And that is basically what's going on there. Uh, basically, what's going on is that they have aliens, they discover aliens, and they, they, they oust the grandfather because of that. Um, Segel is heartbroken. They jump to Segel being an adult. Um, they lose their name. Like, they, they have titles and clans, and the House of El, they don't really have a House of El anymore to speak right. of um, because of this. So what happens is that Sig has to deal with um, bullshit, normal shenanigans. He had to grow up in, the, in basically the equivalent of slums uh-huh. in the world of um, Krypton, which is kind of weird and, but they, they, they explain reasonably well and then some really interesting things happen what happens is that he, he meets a character who claims to be from the future not only from the future but the future of the planet Earth and what happens is that he basically the implication is that someone has come back in the past to F with Superman not being born so it's basically a John Connor something going down and the idea is to stop Superman from being born and you know the show going on there. Uh-huh. And that's the, the story. 
So you think, all right, well, it's kind of straightforward and boring and not interesting, right? Right. But nope. <laughs> they bring in some interesting faction stuff involving the family, the involving Zod. <clears throat> and now the Zod now is the house of Zod. Ooh. But then, later on in the season, you learn that the real Zod, the guy who we know and hate, right. um, comes back in the past to stop Brainiac. Because that's the, the plot going on. Oh, word. And okay. you're not sure what's going on there. And that is a big plot. So the finale now is actually pretty goddamn awesome. Where they do stop Brainiac, they trick him into the Phantom Zone. But then they change time again, and now Zod is um, in charge of Earth. Because uh, the entire um, metric for knowing whether or not you're improving time or destroying time is Superman's keep, right? The main character, Adam Strange, the guy who comes back to help out, who comes to help out Sigel. Right. Th- that character... Um, you can tell by the he bring back the cape, Superman's cape. Right. And right. that was the idea. So yeah, that's that ending and how it builds it builds it well quite well. Yeah, it takes itself a little too seriously, admittedly, hmm. but it works. It I thought it worked for the most part. Now I have, um, I have a question, right? The, the style of it, right? So it's not a superhero show as such, is it? Does it play like not really, what, some kind of like space opera or something? Right, it's very, 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 very serious and melodramatic and over the top. And I think the girl who was one of the Amazons in in One Woman was in this. Okay. Yeah, she plays um, the Zod girl mother. I forget her name, but the Zod girl. She and well, he falls in love, and you learn that General Zod, as we know him, um, he's not only he's the he's the son of. Uh, He's the son of Sigel, so it's implied that he is the cousin of Jorel. Right. Uh, going forward, so that changes all of that. And yeah, I thought this was pretty goddamn awesome. It does a lot of it does a lot of back and forth um, in terms of time travel and a lot of time travel chicanery going down. But right, that's not but, a but big problem. But doesn't make it too confusing. To not answer. really. No. Um, right. you, you could follow it reasonably well going through the seasons. I. Thought the big the big sell of it is the guy who plays Zod. I thought that guy is great. Like holy shit, he should be in the movie. Like I like Michael Shannon, but this guy is awesome, John. Um, and they make him, they design him basically to be like a to a black Terran stamp. So I saw me the book. Okay. <laughs> so, um, overall, um, this was pretty awesome. Okay. Uh, I I recommend it. I don't know if you love it, love it, but uh, the, the main issue is whether or not you, you like it. How serious it takes itself. Mm-hmm. That is a big sell. And if you can if you're not into that, then fine. It it doesn't really work. I right. would give it like a something akin to like an eight out of ten at this point. Um, the, the whole show, not right? the worst thing. Yeah, as as it is right now, not okay, the worst so, thing so, ever. So is it is it that that the, the the critics got it wrong then? Some people were arguing um, about well, sorry, complaining about how serious it takes itself and you know. Right, it takes itself very very seriously. But I'll say only because it designed itself wrong whether or not. You would have embraced those. Um, you would have embraced those those DC movies, and that's the problem. It kind of needs those DC movies to take. And you know, as I say, it's not so much a love hate relationship, but a love, a love and it's slight love and very very hate for well, the writer Man of Steel, right? Because he wrote this as well. Right. Um, yeah, boy. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the Goya. The, the Goya, right? Yeah. Uh, if you give Goya a chance to prepare his material. It could come out good, and this is what we should have gotten. Like this, actually, is well made. It's actually well, you know, production value is solid. You know, for for a TV show, you know, and overall, I I, I actually recommend this. I didn't hate this at all. Um, I thought I'd hate it. I thought I'd be like, wait, it's taking itself too seriously. This bullshit. But mm. the, the problem is that if it if the movies didn't suck so badly, this would have been stronger for me. Right. Because now it it got t- the analogy is like if you like Agents of Shield. You, and you like those Marvel movies? It's like that. It's it's like the Agents of Shield of thing. It's just a bunch of world building to to complement these movies. But because the movies sucked, they didn't worry to connect them at all, and they decided to do their own thing. But they clearly in the same spirit of Manasty, right. right? That's the whole thing, and that's it. Um, I, I imagine I said, the like, music like a, is is kind of similar to right. It all the aesthetic and the look and everything is similar. They clearly borrow from that, but because those movies didn't do so hot. People and they decided to switch tones and 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 they double down in some di- bad directions for the for the stuff. That was the problem. Mm. Um, so they had to change everything up and do this, that, or the other, and wherever it is. I don't really mind that because like whatever, that is the, the production, the business, or the situation. Um, but it's still pretty awesome. 
uh, I enjoyed it. I, I can't say in any bad things about it in any major way. It have a couple of plot issues here or there in terms of pacing, but that's not a big issue for me. That's about it. All right, cool. Well, yeah, I, 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 I guess I'm going to have to give this a look, though. Wow. Yeah, I, I recommend it. it it's it's good. Yeah, again, the guy who plays Zod, awesome. Um, basically, he's Black Terran Stamp. <laughs> um, uh, he's just real intense. Mm. Segel so, so, so himself, I uh, uh, didn't really care for someone. He kind of a little frumpy and didn't really care for him. The girl who plays the girl who's his Zod, I already keep slipping with me because he's supposed to fall in love with her, kind of. But time changed things now. They play, because of the destruction of Kanda in the future, um, it plays out differently for them now. Right. In terms of their relationships, so there's a lot of drama and how it plays out. And in the finale, she goes back with her guy and it's a whole thing there. Mm-hmm. Um, that's about it. I uh, didn't really, nothing else to really major talk about. Special effects good, production value solid. Um, action is okay, but a little flat because, well, nobody have any superpowers any, anyway. <laughs> um, so that's about it. it. I had nothing major else to talk about other than that. I just thought it was pretty awesome for, for what it was. I didn't mind mine at all. I had, I had fun with this. Okay, well, I'll 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 make the effort. Maybe not in a hurry, but yeah, I'll make the I effort to, to, to check it out. So, yeah. sticking with DC now, now we have to talk about um, season what? four of The Flash. Yeah. Um, All right. So yeah, you 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 start, in, off, you in, start off. in premise, in premise, they did the thing I expected them to do, which right. is look, they they couldn't really do the speedster villain again, right? So, so yeah, right. it's been played out with with Sabata, right? It's a little played out. So let's say let let do something, and I what I expect them to do is have basically a really smart mastermind um, using a bunch of methods to, to team up against the Flash in an intelligent way. That's what right. I expected. Which is, That's which what, is what we got for better or for worse. With this pretty story. much what we got, but, but, but what we got was just such a bungled mess of a season. Um, I, I'd, this, I'd actually, prefer, yeah, I'd, I'd actually agree with you here. Yeah, this, this is the worst season in my, in my opinion. Um, you know, season three was a solid season, but the finale kind of sucked, right? For me, right? Yeah, the, yeah this it, it, was just, it, was, it was. It was just. It was to the point of just being confusing, though, especially with the end where, right. well, exactly. You know, when, when um, it stopped, that he was. Has to, Flash has to give up his life because the Speed Force needs someone to be in there, and I'm like, okay, right, so why it's, it's just take old Flash because old Flash too old. I don't. I don't know, but whatever. It just. It was just a little too confusing and. We too right. it, it, drama, but continue. Yeah, the ending was clumsy, but so, but season three overall wasn't half bad. No. Um, but this season, it could have, they didn't. They, you could tell a lot of the energy wasn't there. There are too many jokes, um, too many jokes that didn't really work and fall flat. They tried to make it a funny season. The one big introduction that I liked was well, they bring in Ralph Nibby. He's a pretty good um. Yeah, do you we, know, do we yeah, call him elongated man. man or elong- yes, elongated, elongated man. Elongated man. Elongated man. Right. Plastic man is another character in the universe. Um, right. So they decided to bring the elongated man. Um, they make his character was, was actually pretty good. He has very very good chemistry with Barry. Yeah, um, and I love his his character arc too because at first I yeah. thought that he was just going to be the funny man, the guy who cracks jokes when things get serious. But then things get serious. Right, for but him, that, like, they oh. play on that. Yeah. And then this season, they decide to focus. Like, oh, the show that does a lot of moral, emotional stuff in it as subtext and, and moral lessons. And this season, just I get what they're trying to go for it. A lot of the intelligence being kind of bad, but it was just so clumsy. Um, like, I get it, like the, the poisonous aspect of intelligence, but it, they couldn't flesh this out properly. And then uh, the villain himself was started solid, but then turned out really crappy. That was yeah, the whole, yeah. right? Or the tinker. That's what I say. The season, the season, it was. It started off strong and then unraveled somewhere around the time when um the prison, when they, they escaped from the prison. Because uh, the prison oh, yes, stuff was yes, half yes, bad. Thanks for bringing up that too, because that that's one of the big criticisms of the of the of the season as a whole. But continue. Yeah, um, yeah, and it, they had to they did a trial of the Flash, right? Um, but trial of the Flash was just kind of forced and dumb because that's a big comic thing. Okay, well, uh, and I, I decided didn't to bring that, that to be honest. Right, trial is actually big, but they, they, they make it real dumb because the trial didn't make any sense. And um, they, they didn't think of the trial at all. Was, oh, it was even yeah, didn't make Cecil, any sense at all. Cecil is a terrible lawyer. Um, so that didn't make a lot of sense either. Um, they couldn't write this. They, 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 wrote, it, they wrote it not particularly well. Um, then they decide to have the whole devote taking people's mind stuff. And that didn't really work either because, again, they could have think out devote doing a plan now. 
for taking over the villains and then the final actual plot of Devo what Devo was all about that was kind of weak too when he wanted to just manipulate everybody's mind and everybody's yeah, dumb and yeah. he's a some big anti-technology guy he's some big luddite all of a sudden I was like what? you know, okay. you know because, yeah, but... because Flash that's why right and again this this was just really poorly executed they could have really sit down and make what you call a, a Xanatos Gambit so Xanatos Gambit is when you have a villain who come up with a real dread plan but at no point I really get the sense that, that Devo had a great plan. Like, mm-hmm. you thinking fast, you thinking better than what they thinking about. So, I, I thinking, oh, well, Devo had this dread plan, but it's like, my, it's like why, why flash, it's like, punch this guy or kill him or something at you this know? point. Or not really kill him, but, you know, punch him or knock him out and, and make him lose time to mess up his plan later. You know, apparently he thought of everything, but you have to accept that going forward. And yeah. that's, that's a big problem with this. Um, so, that's about it. I couldn't really... Get into the season. Um, it is the weakest season. I really hope <coughs> the end of the season in an interesting way with the with the with this character they introduced basically Barry and Iris's daughter. Um, well, speaking of Iris, she was kind of great in the season. Not the worst thing ever, but um, they had a where she got the powers for for one. She got speed powers for one episode, and they totally wasted wasted that whole premise. Yeah, boy. Um, yeah, because boy. they could have done a lot of great jokes and premise, but it just make it where she had powers and they didn't really think out the episode. They just half assed it. Yeah, this was a generally half hour season. Um, not, I didn't hate it, hate it, because it had some generally funny moments and some great moments, especially involving Ralph. He was a big add on, add on to the show. But everything else was rubbish. Um, really weak season. I don't want them to go back to the speed surveillance thing just yet. Um, they had an okay arc going on with, with um, Harrison Wells from Earth 2, Harry, yeah. uh, with him losing his intelligence and kind of getting back some of it in the end. But he, he got back, he kind of how to operate without intelligence and Again, they try to get into the whole pathological intelligence stuff. You know, the, the anti Rick and Morty stuff. Now. Mm-hmm. You know, but it didn't work, and I didn't. I didn't really care for it in that sense. Um, I don't know. This this just fall flat for me. I didn't hate it. Hate it. Hate it. But it was really weak overall. They just gonna sit down and make it work. If they, if they just sit down with the script and make it work, it would be better. But they didn't do that. So yeah. I don't know. now, yeah. I'll, I'll try to be short and sweet here, right? Now, you know why you were mentioning certain things that happened in the show? I was like, oh shit, that happened. Because, yeah, yeah a majority of the things in the show did not stand out. Um, reason being is because I felt it didn't quite connect to the overall story. Like, what has what has started off? Like, how the story started off now? What they established? Now, I understand, yeah. you're, you're working with 23 episodes. It can have 23 episodes be about one thing. This is even Game of Thrones can have 10 episodes be about one thing, right? But you have to have some sort of focus. So the, yeah. the, the season starts off with them trying to bring back Flash. Flash is back. He's mumbling a bunch of gibberish and then he says, yeah. Nobody house is bitching. At, at the first few episodes, like leading up to the mid season, we all trying to figure out what does that mean? What does that mean? It's only in the right. end when um, that girl, well, they're gonna see well, they who keep, it is. They, they, but... are the whole, they are the whole house is bitching saying constantly, no. Yeah, but um, when, but, 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 season, but exactly. It's, it's, it and, then, and then it reaches a point where you just forget about it completely. Then somebody was just bring yeah. up. It's like, wait, what was that? And then they forget right. about it. And then the end, somebody says, it. "It's like, wait, that was it. That was it." But it's still do. What? 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 It is. You still haven't answered the question. What does it mean, right? Um, so first it was about um, it was about Barry coming back okay in the process there was this bus and there was 12 people in it and there was the 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 the, 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 the speed force warp down you know portal of it is sorry um, and maybe that was the reason why these people in the bus become metas or maybe it was some kind of orchestrated plan and then we realize it's that and it's from this guy called the Tinker and you have this real sweet wife and all these things going on and then you go to this detour where oh well Barry's arrested because of this now he has to go into jail now we have three episodes with him in jail and then he escapes and oh let's just throw in a little thing with Kid Flash hey remember Kid Flash oh come here with Kid Flash and then right. it's it's jo- um, it's Joe's um new girlfriend being pregnant and it's not right. even that anymore she now, now, now she have powers now she she can yeah. hear people's thoughts and then yeah. in the most annoying way possible now she has to say it out loud it was clumsy so, so, the whole oh, season okay. was like, clumsy like, like, like again it's, it, it, it's like the first couple of times it's, it's funny it's awkward but like nearing the end in particular it just got so goddamn annoying um, yeah 
so more pointers because I, I don't even even want to think up all the the little subplots involved oh <laughs> and okay forget um killer frost killer frost boy and yeah. oh mm-hmm. well i'm not killer frost anymore why and then right. any any realize how she became killer she frost was, in the first place like okay and she was it was from the dark matter yeah, yeah. I, I don't even talk about Cisco. Um, right, you know, they didn't and, do anything and, and with it. Well, they kind of, they kind of do some interesting with him. Uh, yeah, um, the girlfriend where to go back? Well, yeah. sorry, where to go back to the, that particular earth to work with her? But then the daddy, who was played by Danny Trejo, wasted by the way, don't like that. And yeah. that's that's the point I get. That is all these subplots going on. Everybody has a subplot, even right down to Harrison Wells and him losing his memory, which was the most compelling subplot there although right i, I kind of didn't really feel the whole council of wells like the first couple of times happened it was well, cool that, but that, that's right really so do nothing with it afterwards especially that last time exactly them, so i really i thought they would have done something more interesting with the council of wells thing like I, okay so for season five i kind of want an evil council of wells like they should just explore the multiverse because we never see most of those other worlds anyway like we should have the, the cast travel about the place now and they could have do something more interesting with uh, with a lot of that going forward, but they just decided to make the play the councillor well so jokes entirely. Yeah, for jokes. And then you have another version, M- most another of version which of the fell flat, by the way, most of which totally fell flat. Yeah, totally flat. Flat. Totally flat. My yeah. God, the the the, like, the German the German one, terrible. Yeah, it was annoying. Yeah, worst one. Yeah. Like, oh, I, 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 I look, look I like you so funny with with your jokes and right. look at you, you you're not as smart as me. Like, no, shut up, shut up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um. But and, yeah. And, but, Continue, sorry. The, the problem is that um, the problem is that they, they just played for humor. The humor fall flat. And look, I like Tom Cabrera as an actor. He played multiple characters throughout the series. Yeah. Um, and all of them were great. But this 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 just rub rub on me the wrong way. Like yeah, I could and, mind. And, I don't mind somebody humor, but they could have do it more. But be- they could have do that better. Whatever. Right. Right. Everything um, just felt tired and sloppy. You know. Again, look, is the fourth is the fourth season? Every fourth season is suck ass on ECW shows for some reason. <laughs> um, small, I'm since Smallville small days, yeah. so. Smallville, I, Arrow in particular was really bad. So I hope they pick things up back with season five. Yeah, I don't know. But I don't know. For me, the two characters I really cared for overall were Harrison Wells because of what he's going through with the memory thing, with the intelligence yeah. thing, because I really understood how integral being smart was for him and being on the team itself. Like he has no powers, all he has is, is his brain, you know. So that really stood yeah. out to me. And then, believe it or not, um, the elongated man. Because at first when he came in, right, like, yeah. okay, this got me some real peachy shit. This got me real annoying. But then, later what happens with him when he got when he get captured by um, by the Tinker, I was like, oh, okay, wow. And yeah, that episode course, was good. Afterwards, with the loss that that um, that Barry was feeling, I really felt that. But the other stuff, all these other subplots, you know, Barry going to chill and killer frost and she powers and all these little things just didn't really add up to anything um and it, it just felt like it was a strain away from the tinker and his plan and you know when the, the actor who plays him great and everything like that but then it's just once again even right down to the to the mid-season finale all these twists all these turns and it just really doesn't add up to anything now so it almost feels like if they just had a whole bunch of ideas, like the like three seasons worth of ideas, put it in a blender and say, hey, here's that, this is season four. Drink up. Yeah. Um, it just really lacked focus. And that that's the biggest draw drawback that I had with this one. This lacked focus. You move so far away from Barry returning and not knowing where he was and what he was seeing to oh now now um now this is our daughter from the from from, from the future come now inexplicably to help out and now saying, oh, I, I, I regretted that. Sorry for spoiling well, that how it ends. But, yeah, uh, no, uh, um, that's the joke. The but, joke is that she's clearly Barry's kid because she messed up some with respect to time travel, obviously. Um, so she kind of creates her version of a flashpoint in a sense. Um, whatever. Yeah. You go find out. Because <laughs> she clearly well. saved Barry's life at the end. You know, that's, that's the implication that Barry is going to die with that satellite thing. And she went back and basically helped him out a little bit just to take but she come to help. She come to talk to him directly. I want to see what he'll do with her. I'm not sure. She seemed to be kind of interesting, um, yeah, but, but I know. But but just last thing I'll say before I get to my final thoughts. Um, they real underplay her character here now. Like uh, okay, right. okay, okay, okay. You want to bring her in the in the um in the next season. So why have her pop up like this so inexplicably? But in they the got they got the right. Thing? You're right. Explain. They go explain that in season five. Like whatever. Like I, it's, it's not something I take. I took too seriously or cared about. I'm um, frankly. Okay. 
it, uh, it, was, it was just but, like kind of hyping people up, but then kind of just pull right. away like, no, no, let me give it a little sneak peek. You know what I mean? But it doesn't right. really add up to anything. So yes, I do agree with you. This is the weakest of the of the season thus far. Um, yeah, it, they totally, it they totally squander the thinker as a villain. Totally it, it, squander. It does, it does, it does. He's like the Which least, I really come up with us. I'm sorry, yeah. he's like the least memorable, least effective villain I've seen though. Um, but you know what? Yeah, you're you're right though. You know they did have potential for a great villain, but they squandered though. Um, right. Fortunately for me, this I, I, I still gonna I still gonna sold you on with the Flash. I still gonna support it. But they really need to get this shit together with season five, where they have to stay focused, not just on a villain and coming up with these sort of um, binge worthy, you know, endings. Basically, They're trying to, you know, up the ante all the time now. But just stay focused. Tell a story, you know. I know you have twenty three right. episodes to go with, but still, stay focused. Though. Stop giving away all these trajectories and then a losing track and a losing focus and a losing concern, you know. But I mean, it is what it is, but uh, season five, we'll see. Right. I uh, again, it's one of five out of ten. It was pretty weak. They just waste the premise. The premise was a solid premise. They just didn't know what to do with it for some reason or the other. And they just didn't really care about it. Like, I, I was expecting them to sit down and make this work now because, like, I show, I was thinking the writers, the, the, the script writers had a working sense of, oh, well, what, what would a, a non speedster villain be like and how to make that play out? And yeah, the Tinker, the Tinker was the big, the big um, battle plan person. That's the only character that who you could think off the top of the head, like he's a super smart Flash villain, probably him and Grodd, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah, they could have do more with this man. It just really, it didn't have the energy, it didn't have the, the, the it just lack, lack the energy that it should have had. They didn't, no, no, no level of conscientiousness in the writing too much. That's a ton of sloppy mistakes all over the place. Um, I had some fun with it. Some of the jokes was great, in the, especially in the early days. But they just, they just, they couldn't take this. They didn't. They re- really poorly thought out season overall. Yeah. Uh, for me, I would give this a strong two and a half out of five. Um, yeah. Watch it if you want to. I mean, you could skip the season. Probably rewatch season yeah. three if you want to, or go back to season one, see where it was just so brilliant back then. But other than that, this is a season you could skip out. Nothing really too sp- um, spectacular. None, none really big or spectacular really happened. So you know. You could skip the season and more or less look out for, for, for season five, yes, for for what it's worth. Yeah. Right, so now we're gonna get to movies now. We have two movies we're gonna talk about. Um the first one being a movie that I was hearing a lot about. Um I saw one of my favorite YouTubers, Chris Stuckman, did a review for it. And then your yeah. boy, well our boy Movie Bob did a review for it. But this when our fellow TCL, you know, YouTuber Samani Polony did, did a review of it. Great review for it, by the way. Yeah. Um. Now I was like, okay, now now I really need to see what the hype is, right? Of course, we're talking no. about revenge. Yeah. Um. I'll just start off, right? So this is the debut feature of uh, female director Coralie Fagiat. Um, yeah. I'm assuming that she is French because this movie is technically a french american co-production right well it's right, essentially yeah. french but it's shot in in the united states right well, at least i assume it's shot there right um this was making um some buzz on um in tiff last year but what interests me more is the 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 genre of it right which is a reaper revenge film now yeah. i would not call myself a fan of reaper revenge films at all i've only seen three of them well technically um, the first one being, well, it's called Triller, A Cruel Picture. Uh, the alternate version of it is the caller One Eye, right? Um, I actually have that. It's one of those, like, true grindhouse classic movies, right? But very explicitly yeah. to, so in, in terms of sex and violence, right? Um, another one, well, one that um, actually showed on local television. I did actually saw it uncut for the, well, years later one. Well, it I actually... I, I could say this one I really enjoy out of the tree that I saw was called Miss 45, right? This is one of the early films from director E. Right. Ben Ferreira. Uh, really simple premise, but just for the way how, just the style of it alone, I really dug it. And most importantly, I just really love the fact that the, the victim of the rape itself, well, two rapes actually, uh, actually just got herself a gun and just started shooting men um, down. And I was like, but this is what I want to see now, you know? Not spend too much time yeah. on the act of rape itself, but her response to it, right? Even though it's violent. But the most famous one, this is the last one, the infamous one, has to be um, I spit, I spit on, on your grief. 
Yeah. I saw the original one, the 1978 one, and I kind of hated it. I thought it was just... Right. Like, it was real zero budget, but it just felt so... So lazy. Just no story at yeah. all. Just just an excuse to show some girl get raped like three times in the film and then she gets back at her you know at her attackers in like the most cruel way ever uh, but I don't know just I didn't care for the story I didn't care about anything about it it just felt like this real half ass attempt at just shocking me and yeah I was shocked no. by it but not too much like it didn't leave her like wanting to take a shot after it I just look at it and just I just felt nothing about it it just felt so so I don't know. So lame. It, 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 it was just lame in my opinion, right? Um, right. But then, of course, the, 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 the genre was uh, referenced in, you know, one of my all-time favorite movies, Kill Bill, uh, specifically Volume right. 1. Uh, and then, of course, just the idea of this, of a female character going through this terrible ordeal and then coming back for revenge has been seen in other films before, you know what I mean? Uh, but... Yeah, your your quick thoughts on you know just the the genre of the subgenre of the rape revenge. Yeah, the genre, the genre itself, um, it, it's not something I get into all that much, but yeah, it they work for what they are. I'm not I'm not the biggest fan of the um, I'm not the biggest fan of the franchise, but yeah, I remember Spartan your grave. I did, I watched the remake in 2010, I think, and okay, I thought I, it was I, all right. Yeah, I, I kind of heard bad things about it, so that's why I skipped it. Yeah, it was it wasn't particularly good. It's not something I hated, 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 but it, it was all right. And how you had to do is how you had to do is this stuff is that you had to know how to really shoot it from a quote unquote feminine perspective. I mean, it's something like I don't know the other ch- and there's a the problem with rape is that you, you'll make it a, a purely a victimist thing, and the idea of the revenge part already coming. So you get something like the Bandit Queen. Um, ah yes, yes. That is. That, that is just a story on its own that works on the but it doesn't really come across like a re- revenge story. There's a justice aspect to it, maybe, but not really revenge, you know. Um, but then we get this movie, and they do a damn good job with <laughs> with doing the the issue with it, making yeah, that work. Yeah. So I'll I'll jump in. I'll talk about the premise here, right? So we have the character of Jennifer, who's played by uh, Matilda Lutz. Um, yeah. She is having this um this affair with this French millionaire named Richard. So. He yeah. flies her out by helicopter to um to his home, his secluded home is in the middle of this what I assume is American desert. So the the plan is just for them to just have this weekend together, him away from the wife. You know, just have a little fun right. and shit before um he goes on his annual hunting trip hunt. with his two oh, friends, right. um two French friends, yeah. Stan and Dimitri, right? So while they there, well, while Richard and, and Jenna he came there, the, 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 uh, his two friends came early and they're like oh well okay yeah. well alright y'all just stay with us have fun and they do that they spend the weekend just you know having you know having a ball drinking smoking all that good stuff right but right there right there and then we, we, we realize that Stan and Dimitri are ogling Jen you know they're looking at her very sexually you know? right. and then Jen herself you know from the perspective of the film comes off as being very you know nubile very sexual right. and whatnot, but not in a way that she's like openly asking these three guys to you know have sex right. with her right so one thing leads to the other Richard steps out and um, one of the guys uh, I believe is Stanley yeah. kind of just gets hot and, he- and, and heavy he's just like he takes advantage of her um, Dimitri is aware of what's going on but he chooses to ignore it Richard comes right. back finds out what's going on and then one thing leads to the next and um, she's left for dead in the desert. And yeah. just when you think this is it for her, and the way how what happens to her, you, you, you know, logically, you'll think, yeah, there's no way she's coming out of that. Some odd reason, she, she comes back out of it. And as the yeah. title says, she vows revenge on, this, on these three guys, you know, even Richard. Yeah. The one action movie thing that I had an issue with, but it was the biggest problem, was something involving her and blood loss and yes i was thinking yes, yes. she had a little too much blood loss to, to survive it but whatever it's action movie trope you don't really care yeah um it it, it this was more akin to michael bay film <laughs> than anything in my opinion of course even uh, right down to just the way how visually you know jennifer is put, yeah, is yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of or, there, there's a lot of origin teal in this uh, yes it is Right, the desert, right, the desert, right, the glasses shot, yeah, all of the things. Um, I had a lot of fun with this. This probably was similar to how Free Fire was for me last year. Um, oh, yeah, this so a great right, surprise action yeah. flicks, you know, that that stage yeah, the genre. 
yeah, and everything that's br- br- you know that's simple, good, solid filmmaking throughout. Um, solid story, you know, it's a solid script that's really funny and brutal at the same time. The violence was oh, ridiculous and over the top. Oh boy! Yeah. Oh boy! And it, I mean, there's some funny moments that that they just, they just they abuse these squibs with her, like ah, um, yeah, 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 when you. Yeah. Like when you punch him in his nose, and yeah, let's see a ton of blood explode out of the man's yeah. nose. <laughs> but yeah, I was like, what is the part have... where one of these characters get some some um, sharp in the in the in the back of the underneath the foot, sorry, and you pull it out. You just right, yeah, it's a glass, yeah, yeah. That cracks up, eh? And it's easy. The long over the top check, eh? You know, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was just funny. Yeah, all of the jokes and the song. It was great. Uh, I I enjoyed this movie. Just some great, great, decent violence. Um, they make it work and they make the, the pathology of the main villain really really work right? when you find out like he's really the bad guy the other one is trying to capitulate in the worst way um, I, I had a ton of fun with this they, and they, they did some good explanations uh, then the highlight of the film for me is some POT use <laughs> ah yes ah yes yeah. <laughs> smart way of how they use it too not, not just yeah I, 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 yeah exactly they, farty, but it adds a lot yeah, to the story too Right, Especially exactly. What's going on inside of her, basically? Her, her fears, right? Yeah, yeah. But they make they make it work in terms of like what she had to do to solve a problem, and yep. you know they straight up do something out of Rambo. <laughs> yep, yep, um, yep, yep, yep. Yeah, that that a lot of that worked. Um, right. And they they, they 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 set it up, they put it in, they make it work. And yeah, I just enjoyed this in terms of the action. Nothing too, nothing too much. I, I I'm not I'm not sure if I'm going to be talking about this so much so much going forward. But I, I really I really had fun with this one. All right, well, speaking of talking about it going forward, um, this is one that I'm going to be talking about hopefully by year's end because I, I will, I'm going to say it right now. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. This is one of my favorite movies of the year. I did not expect okay. to enjoy this movie as much as I did because at first I was looking at the premise. I was like, okay, I hope they're not going to do the I spit in the grave thing where it's all about right. the rape and the violence on the right. um, exactly. woman. And it's yeah. for you know it's gratuitous and it's for exploitative purposes. Though. Like you're watching this movie to see someone get raped, and that's what I hated about I Spit on Your Grave, the original one, of course. I, don't, yeah. I really care yeah. to see the remake, right? I heard the remake is worse. I hear for more the male gaze and more like a more predatory kind of look at these guys trying to you know torment this woman. That's what I heard. But anyway, right. So I was worried about that going in, but what I really love though is. Okay, right off the bat, the feminists approach it. For one thing, you know, the yes. male gaze, you know, it's it's right there, it, it, big and bold, and you flip it. Back, again. But they flip it yeah. on you so well, especially what happens right. to her, now she has to fight back. And then also, too, quite bravely, you, you see more or less the female gaze, too, because there's a couple of Love scenes where, where Richard himself is, is buck naked, though. I was like, yeah, okay, yeah. You, you see him, I think, I believe you see him twice, you see him naked twice in the movie, while um, Jennifer, you see her naked once. It's like, oh, okay, right. but because, and, you know, once again, a little feminist thing, a little subversion there, because you're looking at the guy from the beginning, it's like, oh, yeah, he, he handsome and all that kind of stuff, but then when he does what he does, that, that flip, and then, yeah, and then in that, in the, the last act, well, the last, you could say 10, 15 minute sequence, which I love, by the way. Um, yeah, so that final battle right? sequence, that final battle scene. yeah, yeah, dude was naked, though, but they yeah, yeah, it yeah. Off it's of, great. you know, just like, the female gaze is just like okay now we're gonna show it again but you, you hate this dude because of what he's been doing so how, yeah. that, how does that look to you now you know what I mean but yeah that, yeah. that last sequence too was was brilliant though. had me on edge the amount of blood lost in that in that scene alone was ridiculous boy. that was like yeah. Kill Bill House of Blue Leaves scene you know yeah. where all the guys getting slashed yeah. up and what that and speaking of of, of Quintarity, you could tell that this director was a lot to quit the too, especially in terms of just blood loss, blood loss, sorry. The amount of blood yeah. being shed in this show. Um, more particularly by the guys itself, by the, by the guys themselves, you know, which is another... Yeah, somebody, about somebody, uh, uh, yeah, somebody violence, it, it, it has a, a kind of almost borderline um, body horror to it, you know, in terms yes, of the, yes, the yes, gore, the kind of, kind of prosthetics they use for the gore, which is, again, some of that shit was hilarious to me, but it's especially, kind of like, especially it, like what, what do you do with, with Dimitri, that's all I was saying that was, that was yeah, some, yeah, yeah. some body horror some evil dead, yeah. ha 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 kind of stuff that they do you know? with, the, with the yeah, with yeah, the yeah, yeah. yeah, um, yeah but yeah, you know it does owe a lot to like, you know, those bloody movies of like the 80s and 90s and of course, Tarantino stuff as well um, the use of color as well, I really loved as well, that just, you know red for, 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 for blood but also these 
you know these orange these yellows especially in terms of the, the set the location this really sparse sort of desert wasteland basically um the premise is simple it's to the point but that's what i love about it because really all about just building tension seeing jennifer really stand up for herself really and take her revenge out against these three guys and how she does it yes it does border on like real grindhouse level violence but yeah them guys deserve it in my opinion you know and it's just every death just amps up there's just more brutal more bloody than the next but it's more on just this visceral you know it's it's more on an entertainment kind of vibe more just that visceral vibe it's not to really disgust the viewer you know unless you see kind of person who don't like to see blood then you, you, it's, it's just meant to entertain you this was a really incredibly entertaining movie um yeah yeah matilda lutz though i thought that she killed it as jennifer um yeah. You know, just her transformation was so dramatic, so incredible. Eh? Yeah. At first, you 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 tell yourself, okay, her tra- like her how how she set up in the beginning to where she is now. Yeah, she's, she's like this. Totally. Like, yeah. And dare I say, dare I say, dare I say, she could she could rival Alicia Vikander as Lara Croft, Jen, Tomb Raider. Right. That was sorry, and it's like, like, I was watching her. I was she like, could take she over. Could have been, yeah. She could have been Tomb Raider though. She could have been in the yeah. movie. No disrespect to Alicia Vikander. I mean, I love you and everything, but but a lot too. I mean, she have it down. She yeah. have it down. Um, I love the music. The kind of um, synth heavy kind of eighties vibe to it. You know, yeah. uh, at first I wasn't really feeling the music because it kind of felt a little cliche. But then when things started to get more and more tense, that's when the music got more experimental and more yeah. really unnerving. And I really love that. Uh, the performances I thought were great. I love the 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 well yes it is a french language film but i love the effort made by the guys in particular to to speak french uh sorry to speak english yeah yeah yeah. i thought that they right. did it well for the most part i understood what was being said and whatnot and then make for some particularly funny moments as well especially when they overreact to the stuff i just yeah. come up on so that's how these guys yeah suffer as well like i i'm sorry like i'm a guy but i was enjoying what i was seeing here you know what i mean but yeah. once again like you know it's a feminist perspective on the genre which is right. really what I praise about. Really praise this movie for this the balls, haha, for for for, be, yeah. for really flipping this this genre on its on its heels, basically. You know, yeah, really they, they, they make they make this work out fine. Um, yeah. and, and, and well, last things last, I want to say most important thing that I love about this show is that um, they did not concentrate on the rape itself. Like it happens. Right, they don't spend too much time on it. In a very yeah. clever way, they move away from it. And it just adds so much to that because it's like, yeah, you know it going on, but you just as guilty as the guy who who, who partaken in it because you chose to ignore yeah. it. You know what I mean? And then later right. on, you know, some people, some idiots might argue, but, you know, he didn't really deserve what happened. You know? um, yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yeah. <laughs> Not just well, for they make it, it, they make it, yeah, they really his character is in general. They are really right. cool-hearted bastards and they, they deserved everything that they got to them. Even if it does go way over the top, but I was like, yeah, that that guy deserved that shit. Yeah, yeah, they, they make it they make it work for what they did, did, did. Um, and that's the, the whole thing with the, this movie. Unfortunately, uh, for them is that they had to set up this scenario and how dumb they were. But they had some great moments with, with them. Like one of the funny moments with viewers when he say, "I'll take out the AC." Yes. <laughs> yeah. This stuff is like, please take it off yeah for the environment for the, the environment, environment right just just do yeah, it. No? just do it <laughs> so it had yeah, these stupid. real subtle moments of dark humor as well um which i which i really loved um but just really the tension of it because like it's, yeah. especially the last 10 50 minutes so many most kneel biting moments probably the most yeah, biting moment i've seen in film all year boy but as a debut this was solid you could tell this person loves the genre and was willing but she to think just, it out but subverted but in a real clever intelligent way while giving us the the visceral trills that we we kind of come to expect from a film like this you know what i mean we kind of expected yeah. it and she just delivered do on all cylinders she just fired everything up so yeah i would go out of my way to say yeah this is one of the best movies i've seen this year i'm not saying that oh it's a masterpiece or anything like that no just for given me my money's worth and so much more i did not expect to enjoy this movie so much i did not expect to to really feel for jennifer to really feel her her quest for revenge and just be so satisfied by how bloody it was so yeah 
maybe this might be my guilty pleasure of the year. I don't know, but for now, this is right. one, of my, one of my one of the favorite one of my favorite movies of 2018, hands down. This gets a strong four to five. Do see this as soon as you can. Um, whether you, yeah. if you want to wait for it to come out on home media, do so. Or if you want to watch it on VOD, do so. Um, right. This is one of the biggest surprises of the year, hands down. I did not expect to love it as much as I did, and it's just off of the. It's a genre movie. Just go in knowing it's a genre movie. So, not everything logically makes sense. Like how you know, like what we mentioned before with the whole blood loss issue, but just go with it. Go with it, and you will enjoy it. This is far yeah. from rape. It takes out rape. Like rape is there, but it's really about revenge. And just the simplicity yeah. of the title alone, yeah, you 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 will get your money's worth here. So definitely right. see revenge. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. For me, for me, I put it. Yeah, I get this one on low IMAX. Um, this one just solid filmmaking, really well panned out. Um, good editing, good music choices, good shots. That's some great, great, great cinematography. Cho- cho- great, yeah, cinematography. great cinematography. Some nice choice of shots. I mean, everything about it was it's very very well planned out. Yeah, and well, you know well made you can tell it was a lot of thought went into this from since a long time ago yes yes um, yes going forward yeah. but yeah yeah I had this a lot of fun with this and yeah this might make my top 10 list with you I'm not sure but it might right um, and last things last as far as debut features go this is excellent though I really can't wait to see what Coralie uh, Faggett forgive me if I got the name wrong does with like her next project okay, let's give her a bigger budget let's see what she could do but I, I, I see like action horror flicks uh, up her alley so you know i just really can't wait to see what she brings right. here to the table but yo great job with revenge can't wait can't wait to see what she does next all right cool and closing things off now we have fahrenheit 451 yeah which is, and i didn't um, watch this oh you, oh man oh god you didn't wow okay no i didn't watch it so I didn't, i'll tell it uh, uh, don't tell it no you didn't no you told me this oh. anyway so okay. this is directed by um, Ramin Barani. Um, he made right. a film called Chop Shop, which I know I was supposed to watch. I know Roger Ebert loves this movie. He heals it one of the best movies he's ever seen, but I just never got around to see it. Or maybe I did see it, but I just never got around <laughs> to watching it, right? Um, it's a really f- popular movie from 2007. But anyway, so um, this is both a remake of the 1966 the classic um, Dysopian film of the same name and another retelling of Ray Bradbury's um, famous novel which I haven't read but um, Ricardo have you read the, the book or watched the original? Uh, yes a very very long time ago I read it um, it's, it's decent it's, he has a problem with it eh? <laughs> the idea of having a Fahrenheit 451 movie on TV is kind of hilarious and ironic because the whole shtick of the movie wasn't to do it censorship necessarily but it's the public access saying that they should burn new ideas on books now right because of television so you know Bradbury was seem apparently very anti-television when he wrote the book okay so to see a show on television is that kind of thing on its own now. it's kind of weird yeah all right well yeah. I, I haven't read the book but um, I saw the movie quite recently um, it's directed by Francois Truffaut one of the the iconic figures of the yeah. French New Wave um, yeah and you could see it in the film because it has these ra- these French New Weave kind of things, you know, where it's not so much about, you know, special effects and set pieces. It's more about the mood and the tone and what's going on in the frame, basically, right? What he's showing you. Um, it's a British film. It's the first English language film that he did. Um, yeah. As far as its status go, I mean, I yeah, I mean, it, it deserves its classic status, but it's one of those shows that you watch it's like yeah this this kind of old man this kind of old boy like the the choices of 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 camera angles the costume design it's it's very i don't want to say cheesy but it's it it hasn't aged well at all though (laughs) unfortunately um it features oscar Werner, who plays guy montag and julie christie and you know i just had to beat myself up over the head for not realizing this was watching the film but uh, she plays two characters in the movie. She right. plays Clarice, who I'll bring up in this remake, and she plays Guy's wife, Linda. It's like, why have Julie played two characters? Like, I know she's a popular actress back then, but why have her played two characters? I don't know. Um, right. But I mean, in terms of its world building, it's just like, okay, well, people they don't like books, blah, blah, blah. It 
really does drag a lot but i particularly was intrigued by the story um i love the whole idea of this society in the end where it's like well this secret society of people where it's like yeah we've we've each one of us has memorized a particular book i thought that was a real cool t- uh you know idea i love the the yeah. end of the movie where it's just seeing all these characters just walking by like if they're walking along a street but they're just reciting lines from a from from the book that they that they assigned to learn there. I thought that was like a real yeah. nice way to end it off. Even though the movie itself just kind of dull and kind of drags on a lot. Um, they, they do a couple of green screen shots that look terrible. Um, but that's all I was say. But, you know, I, I do understand its status, right? It's not uh, one of my favorite dystopia movies, but I do see why it's a classic, right? I guess it's because of the time it came out too, but whatever. Which leads us to this remake here. Um, yeah. And... Pretty much, this is like a loose adaptation of you know the the source material and this movie here. So, Guy Montag here is played by Michael B. Jordan. We have Captain yeah. Be- Captain Betty again, who's played by we boy Zod himself. Yeah, he does, Michael he, Shannon. He, he just won't. Yeah, he just won't. Um, he just won't stop lighting things on fire. Yeah, yeah. So Michael B. Jordan. Yeah. Michael, well, Michael B. Jordan. Well, Guy Montag, yeah. sorry. Like, I initially for the trailer, I would say that he has this kind of pyrotechnic sorry pyromaniac vibe about him but not really exactly like he understands the idea of his job basically which is he's a fireman and in this future it's like you know books are banned so if you find anybody with books they apprehend you they take all the books and they create this bonfire like right in the middle of the street and what they do quite creatively here with this movie because it's 2018 guys so come on is that they post it on well i don't want to say social media but it's more like like a Facebook Live or Instagram Live kind of thing. See, so right, like the emoji con- things yeah. kind of pop up and stuff. It's like, oh, well, we're burning books. You see all these little emoji things pop up and things. So I thought that was like a, a really cool contemporary way to approach the, 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 uh, the source material right. there. That was cool. Um, and then this, because of this now, um, Guy is like this rock star. He's like the hero here. It's like, yes, Guy is burning books. Yeah, you know what I mean? And he's like one of the, the most popular of the, the firemen here. But he, you know, um, Captain Betty is still his superior. He still has to follow his orders. And Betty is, you know, as psychopathic as you would expect uh, Michael Shah's character to be, but more subtly in a way. You know, he's not overly psychotic, but you know there's something dark going on with him. And similar to the original movie, Guy runs into the character of Clarice, who is played by uh, Sophia Botella. Uh, she is no. basically like, she just like, in the underground basically so she she hustling different items for different people and in this case she knows where people have books and whatnot so she and then later we reveal that she is part of the resistance you know these people like i said before who have this knowledge of books here right so eventually um but forgot to mention too she starts off as being this informer for michael shannon right so she knows where certain things going down where certain people are she gives them tips and then they go down in their fire trucks apprehend the people you know if they have to use violence so be it but it's never to kill them it's just to bring them just to apprehend them basically take out all the books torture them out right um yeah we as i mentioned before uh well when, when we talked about it before well the the trailer for it sorry uh kia dulia uh who is from you know 2001 a space odyssey he makes it a parent uh as this guy who's more or less reciting from a book and then they they, they stop him uh when he's it you know been recorded basically right but essentially, the story is about Guy, and he, well, basically, the, the sighted incident, similar to the movie, is where they go by this uh, this this mansion, basically, and this old woman lives there, and she has, like, a ton of books, like, a whole library of books, and instead of, you know, giving herself up to the firemen, she tortures herself on fire, she, you know, she's, she, she, she's incinerated herself, that she commits suicide, basically, right? And that is the moment which pretty much shocks Michael B. Jordan. Uh, and similar yeah. to the old film, she, he he uh, he steals a book, and he really s- begins to understand you know why books are so pop- uh, powerful basically. And he does bring in this whole new subplot out of the blue, where the resistance actually has some kind of plan. I forgot the name of it. Uh, where they want to like wire the DNA of the the knowledge of the books themselves it's kind of weird but it's basically like this dna code and they want to inject it into this bird 
uh, the idea is that once they get the bird and extract the deity, they'll be able to kind of re re recall the, the, you know, the, the, the history of books itself, of literature, of the internet, because yes, the internet is wiped out too. So I guess the idea is to spark the knowledge that was lost over the years because right. of the, the lies and the hypocrisy and all that kind of stuff. But it's in DNA code, which makes no sense. But I'll stop there in terms of premise, right? So I was kind of hoping that you would have um, would have would have put your two cents into it because this is one of those shows yeah. that you would say, yeah, um, it's been done one too many times before. It's one of those kind right. of shows, you know. If you've seen films like Equilibria, like that is the perfect reference point here. Right. You see right. these dystopian films where it's like, well, we have to remove this type of information because this type of information is bad. And while the explanation for it, which Michael Shannon does in that scene, which takes place in the mansion, I do understand where he's coming from. And it makes sense more in this movie than in the old film. In the old film, it's more like it's different people's opinions, and these opinions, you know, don't work with the society that we have, so we have to get rid of them. In this case right. here, it's more like, oh, well, if these people don't like what's being said here, we burn them. So you say, oh, well, Huck Finn, sorry, Huck, Huckleberry Finn. You know, the, the black people didn't like that because they have a character, a black guy. So right, uh, nigga Jim, yeah. Yeah, nigga Jim, we, we burn it. We have this book here. The feminists don't like it, so we burn it, right? So it's a it's more or less him seeing, while well, he said his mindset, that the society that's shaped here, they want things to be at a certain way. And if these old books are seeing something that kind of that counteracts that, whether it's with religion or philosophy or whatnot, Burn it, right? So it, it kind of makes sense the way how he explains it here. Problem is, though, not enough world building because, for one thing, they have this subplot where all the firemen assume that Benjamin Franklin was the first fireman. Right, right. And they never really yeah, establish who who came up with that. But right. you, you well, understand I mean, that's the that whole point of. Like, yeah. Up the whole one. Yeah, it's kind of this broken history. Yeah. Control. I don't know, but yeah. But uh, yeah, you're, you're but right. But it's kind of propaganda and bullshit now, yeah. Yeah, but it could have given us like a little history as to how this society that we see here in the film was set up, right? Um, Cinematography-wise, um, I love how dark the world feels and looks. Although it does yeah. play on the whole cliche, well, if you're doing dystopian, you know, sci-fi movies, everything has to be dark, everything has to be in shadow and silhouette, you know, so they play that. A majority of the scenes do play out at night, but it works in terms of creating this whole dark kind of nightmarish tone, because unlike the, the old movie, the presence of the fireman feels much more threatening and scary here in this movie, you know, um, yeah. they do feel like this threat, you know, it's almost like stormtroopers, you know, they come in, they break inside your house, they run out your house, they burn, you, they burn up your house, it has that kind of feel to it, you know, and just the mere fact that they start fires instead of get rid of fires makes it even scarier, right? Um, right. Michael Shannon, I thought, was was decent as a villain, you know, he could play these, these characters in his sleep already, um, but now I had to get to the main problem with this movie. Not enough um, character development. A majority right. of these characters come off too two-dimensional, in my opinion. Like, these are the characters. These are who they are. This is what they do. And this is why they do. But you never really get to understand what's going on deep inside. So they have right. this thing going on with Michael Shadow where, like, when he's home, he takes out these little pieces of paper and he writes little quotes. Now, I was wondering if they were going to explain that. Maybe he's read books before. Maybe it was part of his uh, his education. Because, yes, before being a fireman, you have to learn about, uh, you know, the history of why these books are bad in the first place. But I'm assuming that right. maybe he has read books before and these the quotes that he had. But then he would write these quotes and then afterwards he would burn them. Why? I don't know. They never explain, right? Um then there's this thing with uh, with guy himself. This these these flashbacks that he he keeps having with him and his dad, and it, well his dad was a fireman as well too. And for some reason he was arrested, but we never really understood why. But at at the end we never really understood why at all, you know. But that's supposed to be the part of the motivation for for Michael to just for guy sorry to change character. And then also it was a changing character. The other yeah, forces robots with him and Clarice. You know, because she shows him how great books are. And, you know, just read together. And yeah, you know, and now all of a sudden, I want to fight with the resistance because you yeah. just read a book with this one chick. Like, in the movie, in the old movie, 
it, they kind of explained it a lot better with the with the wife and how desensitized she was to television so it kind of makes sense here but his but guy in this movie here his his the the change of character was just so sudden it was just so blatant just out there just to get the story rolling and then also last but not least that whole subplot with the bird and the, the dna thing just made no sense to me at all like okay i get that you right. you want the resistance to be the last hope right okay now in the last movie it made sense that all these people just have to do is just to hide out and just read the books and then in like in this one powerful scene that they did in the old film pass that knowledge on to your to your uh, to the to the to the youth basically right so you had this great scene where this old man was talking to his son or his grandson and having them recite you know a full book great scene right and here it's just like all right you know this book okay cool but we have to spark this knowledge to the world but we're gonna do it through dna what yeah uh, it weird, yeah and then they just bring that up halfway into the movie like so when the end of the second arc is like oh well there's this dna thing you know blah 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 blah, blah. And now we learn what it means and now we have to find these people who have it and stop them and last last things last i felt that the ending was quite anticlimactic it just kind of well that stops but it ends bleak but then they kind of give you this little glimpse of hope but like i understand what he was trying to say like in the last couple of scenes but because of that whole dna thing it just still makes no sense anyway uh it still kind of leaves things out there like you know what if they don't find the bird that's all i'll say what if the bird dies or gets misplaced or you know loses okay. its way so the plan was really was 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 set to fail anyway and you know me i i, I like closure i want closure in my movies right so I, I, it left it, it kind of left forward okay so what happened to this guy what happened to this girl what happened to these characters this kind of stops like what happened i want to know you know what I mean? and slight little spoiler here but they they, they don't do it they, they kind of did it in the, the old film but they do it here in this one um okay you're getting torch right why why would you make this why would you turn this to such a dramatic moment something so horrifying like you would set up and just be like yes engulf me flames engulf me i'm not gonna say a yeah. single word i'm just going to be engulfed in flames and die no screaming no that only one person i see get tortured and scream one person yeah. will be get tortured and scream everybody else is like yes take me oh eternal fire i'm not gonna say a word i'm just gonna die dramatically and gracefully like come on man. really yeah yeah <laughs> like normal drama yeah um but in short though like i get what he was trying to do with this one here uh, uh, with this remake here trying to make it all contemporary and yes they do you know touch on you know uh, the internet not being there and, you know just the idea of books being bad you know it, it the explanation for it makes a little bit more sense here but i felt the world building could have been much better done uh you piece it for one thing because this movie clocks in at about an hour and 25 minutes so much and i felt that they kind of just rushed through the story they kind of given some more time to just develop the world develop the characters and once again if you've seen stuff like this before this won't be new to you would you would know pretty much beat for beat what's gonna happen next even if you haven't read the original source material or see the the, the old film and i to confess yeah. this is kind of a forgettable movie though unfortunately no I, I i know you know the cast and crew went in with great intentions but i don't know why they just kind of done so much more with this car with this, with this uh with the story here and such a great story yeah. as well you know even though i still wouldn't buy into the whole idea of oh well, books are evil you know i, I kind of get but i kind of don't get it. that's what i say and you know yeah. great performance you know that decent performances by my by the two michaels but because the characters were just so two-dimensional yeah you, you, you know what I mean? you, you just kind of knew what was going to happen even though it just kind of ends on this unfortunate kind of anti-climatic note they could have really done so much more with this movie here so for me i will give this a very light three out of five it was all right it's not the worst thing i've seen but it's far from memorable in my opinion um <laughs> and i actually don't want to read the book to see what the big deal is about the show but other than that though see it talked about it here but believe me by tomorrow <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna completely forget about this show so whoever yeah it as it all right all right, all right, so with all that being said, Ricardo, where can we find you online? 
Uh, Passat R M E D Y. That is at R M E D on Twitter, and then you can type in Ricardo Medina on Facebook. You should find me there. All right, you could also find me on Twitter. Just look for Legally Black M J B, M J B in capital letters. You could also find me on Facebook. Just look for my name, Matthew Bailey, along with a Legally Black blog official fan base, where you find a link to this podcast as well as the others that we've done over the past couple of years. And also, you could find me on Instagram. Just look for Matthew Bailey reviews. All right, so stuff to look forward to. Well, I think there's only one show we can think of right now. Solo. Yeah, Solo. Uh, Solo. Shipping me thought that we would get it last week, but no, we actually get it this week. So uh, I'm going to make the effort to, to, to go see it. Uh, not expecting much out of it, but, you know, just want to be entertained. That's all. And yeah, that's pretty much about it. So once again, guys, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, whatever this is. This was Matthew Bailey and Ricardo Medina. And we are signing off from another episode of DSP Sabili. So until the next one, guys, take care. Peace.